Sworn to Sacrifice, A Christian Military Romantic Suspense, Book Number Four, Clean Billionaire Standalone Holiday Romance Series, written by Christina Ryan. Narrated Chapter by One. Grace Noble. Blaine Carter had finally reached his goal. Through mounds of obstacles and years of stress, he'd made the rank of staff sergeant. He stood in his living room for a moment, admiring his promotion certificate. Still elated from receiving the promotion at formation earlier today, where his entire unit had shown up to surround him with applause, Blaine hooted once more and jumped into the air. He needed to celebrate. Get out for a night on the town and go somewhere, anywhere, it didn't matter. As long as there was food. Blaine's spirits were so high he worried if he didn't satisfy them soon, he'd pass out from sheer energy repletion. He kicked the pile of socks out of the way and skirted the table just in time to avoid banging his knee into the glass. Bracing himself against the couch, Blaine laughed into the empty room. But his energy couldn't be contained. Moving into the joint kitchen he shared with his barracks roommate, he swiped his phone off the mini-counter. He'd already contacted his good friend, Chase, but he wasn't available. Surely at least one of his buddies was free. He called Jesse, one of the guys in his squadron. As the ringing continued, he threw open a cabinet, searching for a snack to satisfy him before he splurged on a big celebratory dinner. All he found was a half-eaten graham cracker and an expired bag of Cheetos. Blaine closed the door and ended the call, dialing Jake's number. He could smell the food already, the succulent juices dripping off the meat, the ketchup and mayonnaise oozing off the bun. His mouth watered and his stomach growled. Hey, Carter! I heard the news! Congratulations! Jake shouted into the phone. Blaine wiped his mouth, glad no one could see him salivating. Thanks, Jake. You up for celebrating? Sorry, I can't. Last minute duty swap. Aw, oh, man! But I'm sure Douglas or Roberts is available. Yeah, let me try them. Thanks. After checking with the other two guys in his unit, Blaine discovered they were unavailable too. Douglas already asleep, according to his barracks roommate, and Roberts out of town for the weekend. Blaine's weekend wasn't looking all that exciting, after all. Still, he needed to get out, even if that meant he'd be going solo. Grabbing a light jacket, he made his way to his newish Honda Accord and drove a few exits past the Miramar base to a popular restaurant row. As expected on a Friday night, all restaurants were packed. He decided on one of his favorite places, Gary's Gourmet Burgers, and headed inside. At least being single sometimes had its advantages. He got seated at the bar as soon as he gave the hostess his name. Cindy, his favorite bartender, darted back and forth, the rest of the bar full of weekend goers, including sailors and other marines, and a handful of couples. Cindy finally made her way to him, her mouth slightly open as she caught a breath or two while she took his order. The usual, Blaine? I'll start with uh, an appetizer this time, some gooey nachos with jalapenos, and an ice water. You got it. She whirled and flew to the other side of the bar, scooping ice into a glass. He scanned the list of burgers and settled on the Hawaiian special. Cindy reappeared, setting down an abundance of nachos and a tall glass of ice water with a lemon wedge on the rim. Ready to order? She poised a pen over a small notepad. The Hawaiian burger with the seasoned fries, please. She scribbled something down. Ooh, now that's your usual. She stuck a hand on one hip. Now when am I going to see you here with a woman on your arm? He shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine. Whoever she is will definitely be the luckiest woman alive. Thank you, ma'am. His cheeks flushed. Cindy always enjoyed flirting with him. She'd even asked him out once when he first started frequenting the establishment years ago. When she realized he just wasn't interested, she'd stopped asking, but that hadn't stopped her from teasing him from time to time. She chortled. Always such a gentleman. Scooping up his menu, she dashed to the other end of the bar, her blonde ponytail swinging and plugged in his order. Blaine munched on the warm, cheese-soaked chips and sipped his drink, doing a little people-watching. His eye caught on a young couple near the entrance. The woman had long brown hair that hung over her arm. Her date was smiling as he gazed into her eyes and ran his fingers through her hair. A few feet across from them, in a booth, sat an older couple who were chatting and laughing as they shared a huge piece of chocolate cake. Blaine turned his attention back to his plate and dragged a large chip across the puddle of cheese before slipping it into his mouth. Being in love eluded him still. 
The Marines took up most of his work week, and he also did copy editing for an advertising agency every Thursday in Malibu Bay, where his parents lived. The beach was about a 20-minute drive, so it made it easy to see them after work before heading back to base the next day. But he still craved love, the kind his parents shared. Faithful, enduring, enjoying one another's company, full of laughter and hope. He stuck another chip in his mouth. He wanted that kind of love more than ever. I have your burger for you. Cindy put the plate on the bar. That was fast. When he checked the clock on the wall behind her, twenty minutes had already passed since he'd placed his order. Man, apparently he'd been doing some serious daydreaming. The giant hamburger looked delicious, the teriyaki sauce running outside of the bun. Is there anything else I can get for you? She asked as she refilled his water. No, ma'am, this looks perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. Enjoy, Blaine. He grabbed the giant burger and bit into it. A plethora of flavor zinged inside his mouth. Warm pineapples, crunchy onions, and a large juicy tomato slice slathered in teriyaki sauce instantly gratified his palate. The warm pineapple particularly tasted like heaven. Not for the first time, he wished he had this moment to share with someone, especially given his long-awaited promotion. He took another mouth-watering bite of the burger, then stuck a couple of pepper-seasoned fries in his mouth. The noise in the restaurant rose an octave, the excitement of a weekend permeating the crowd. Blaine finished his meal, enjoying the ambient atmosphere and the delicious food. He asked for the check. A minute later, after paying and generously tipping Cindy, he slipped into his jacket and headed to the exit. The old couple had already left, and a few teens were sitting in the booth. The younger couple remained at their table and were in full view. But the man was no longer smiling. The lines around his dark face pinched his forehead and mouth. His left hand gripped the edge of the table, and his other hand remained tangled up in the woman's hair, but there was tension in his bicep. As Blaine passed the couple, the man tugged on her hair and she grimaced. Blaine stopped just inside the entryway, and his heartbeat ramped up. Behind him, the man spoke, his voice low and dirty. You will be mine forever. Don't you even think about leaving me again or it will be your last thought. The woman's voice came out softly, the words pouring out in trembling pieces. I won't. I promise. Blaine took a step forward, heaved open the door and stepped outside. The thickening darkness wrapped around him in a silent threat. His heart rate was still spiked, a boiling pressure filling his whole body. He wanted to go back in there and rip the guy out of his seat, yell a few choice words at him, and toss him on his butt outside. But in his experience, those actions would likely open up a dangerous door of retaliation. That didn't bother him. What worried him is what his response might do to the woman. But he already knew. He'd seen it before. During college, when he was taking classes toward his B.A. in English, he developed many friendships, including two women who were involved with controlling men. One of those women suffered physical abuse so severe she wound up hospitalized, but thankfully left her abuser once she was released. She immediately filed a report, sending him to jail. But the other woman stood by her abuser and suffered severe emotional and mental consequences, including his many illicit affairs. When one of her male friends stood up for her, her boyfriend's mind games quickly led to physical bruising. Blaine looked around the corner of the building. The man's face was inches from the woman's, his mouth wide open, his eyes flaring with intimidation. She recoiled from him, but there was nowhere for her to go. Everything within Blaine told him he had to do something, or this woman would never be free from her tormentor. Taking out his phone... Blaine put in a call to the police and reported as much as he could, including the thick black hair of the predator and the snake tattoo Blaine spotted on his forearm when he finally released her hair. With the call ended, Blaine made his way down to the walkway and waited for the police to arrive. He kept his eyes fixed on the couple. The dark-haired animal was stuffing his face. The back of the woman's shiny brown hair was now twisted in knots from his slimy, manipulating fingers. Blaine's body jolted, the desire to go back inside overwhelming. But the police would be here soon, and he had to let them do their job. He jerked his head away from the window and focused on the highway. A moment later, a cruiser pulled into the parking lot. Two officers, one male, one female, hopped out. Blaine walked over to them and introduced himself as the caller. The female officer thanked him and waited with her partner for the couple to come outside. 
Blaine slipped inside his car parked across from Gary's entrance. The couple emerged a few minutes later. Blaine watched discreetly from behind the wheel. The officers took turns addressing the couple. The woman, he noticed for the first time, though her face appeared distraught, was beautiful. Dark lashes framed her soft brown eyes. Her cheeks looked smooth, tinged pink and stained with tears. The guy nodded, his fingers lightly tapping against his wrist. He was saying something and remaining calmer than he had been inside the restaurant. The male officer addressed the woman. She shook her head and responded briefly. They exchanged a few more words, then the two officers headed back to their patrol car. The couple were holding hands as they approached a white older model compact car. He opened the passenger door and she got in. He leaned down to kiss her forehead but lingered there for a moment, his lips working against her skin as he muttered something to her. When he pulled back, she nodded up at him. He closed the door and went to the other side. A moment later, the guy sped off, his tires screeching as he burned rubber. His maneuver proved so rough the car leapt slightly into the air when he jerked around a corner. Blaine didn't know the guy, but he recognized his kind. A player. A liar. A manipulator. They knew how to engage the game, how to fool the police, how to control their girls, how to instill fear into them so they would do anything to protect the guilty. Feeling sick, Blaine unlocked his Honda and got behind the wheel. His knuckles were taut as he started the engine. He'd done what he could to help the woman, but it didn't feel like enough. He almost regretted not giving the guy a piece of his mind, humiliating him in front of the rest of the patrons, something that would unsettle him, knock him off his pedestal. But he also recognized that doing so would likely endanger the guy's girlfriend even more, and he would never have been able to live peacefully with that decision wondering if she was okay. As he drove into the city, hoping to find some kind of nightlife where perhaps some of his unit might be hanging out, he tried to put the image of the woman out of his mind. Her shivering lips and the fear in her eyes seemed etched inside his mind. A woman should feel safe inside a relationship. She should be cherished. It was Blaine's job to make sure the country was safe. He felt powerless that his attempt to help safeguard a woman had failed because of some slimy, sick man who needed to control her. He shook his head as he gripped the wheel harder. He had to concentrate on something else. Surely he could do that. He'd gotten his much-desired promotion today. He had a promising future in the Marine Corps. A loving family, loyal friends, all good things. The lights of the city beckoned to him from the many establishments. A comedy club, a tavern featuring live music, Dave and Buster's, a cafe, a bowling alley, more restaurants and bars. The Pacific Ocean to his left had its own nightlife. People had campfires going. Further down, crowds already lined up for the midnight whale-watching show that would end next month, marking the beginning of spring. After driving in circles for a while, he finally decided on the comedy club. He sat watching the show, wanting desperately to laugh to lose himself in the entertaining moments of the stage, but his mind would not let go of the scene back at the restaurant. The woman was beautiful, sure, but it was more than that. He felt compelled to shield her from harm, like it was his job as much as being a cybersecurity technician. Blaine found himself encumbered with concerns. He wondered where they were now. Had the douche taken her home? Did they live together? Did she have a trusted friend she could turn to? More than all of those other thoughts, one stuck out the most. Chapter How two. safe was she? Jenna smiled up at Mike when he turned his piercing black eyes on her. It was the look he used to hold her in place. Whether he desired an extra long kiss or he was about to scold her once more. Mike's intentions never mattered. It was her response that did. Even if she was sad or distressed or tired, she must always be happy to see him. Hi, Mike, she said as she kissed him softly on the lips. They were getting ready to watch a movie on her TV. She had vacuumed the living room just in time for his arrival. She felt overworked, having put in extra hours at her accounting job this week, but she refused to let herself look worn out. She already knew what happened if she didn't appear first and foremost glad to see him. He had reminded her of that just yesterday. 
Mike had made them reservations at Gary's Gourmet Burgers with the sole purpose of exposing her alleged lover. Mike was convinced she was seeing someone on the side and that he frequented the restaurant. Jenna had no idea why he thought this, nor did she dare question him. It didn't matter that she lived over an hour away or that it wouldn't make sense for her to go out of her way to secretly see someone, which she would never do anyway. Mike never cared if he upset her because he always expected her to be fine. No matter what he did or said, he'd forced her to look at some man sitting at the bar. It was the first time she'd ever seen him. His hair was cut short, military style. He probably worked on the base, which wasn't too far from Gary's. He'd been wearing a black t-shirt, and his broad shoulders filled the sleeves. His jacket had been slung over the back of his chair. He'd turned in his seat to glance outside. His face looked pleasant, with soft lines around the edges and a slightly squared jawline. Even though she denied knowing him, much less ever seeing him before, Mike insisted she was lying. The disagreement had quickly escalated into Mike becoming verbally heated. And when the police came, Mike blamed her, though she'd never even left the table, much less done anything that entire time but devote her attention to Mike. He didn't seem very interested in you, Jenna. Good for him. But if I find out that you are seeing him, you'll wish you'd never been born. Mike glared at her, the hardness of his dark eyes fierce and void of any of the kindness she'd once seen. Only six months ago, when he swept her off her feet at a nightclub, he'd made her feel more special than she'd ever felt in her life. For a while, she thought of herself as the most blessed woman on earth. About a month ago, Mike changed, like something in him snapped. He went from a man who gave her gifts and made her feel like a queen to a man who went into a rage over everything. The first time he had gotten angry had been her fault. Well, that's what he said when he showed up and dinner wasn't ready like she promised. She started to remind him how he had told her he would be bringing takeout. Then he slapped her across the cheek. Over the next hour, he sat her down and lectured her on the role of a woman, on obedience and respect. She never disagreed with him again. But that didn't stop him from hitting her a couple more times for good measure. Jenna wanted to leave him. But how? He knew where she lived, where she worked and his threats were becoming more forceful, more promising. If she left, she feared what he might do then. His voice sounded strained as he towered over her. I think it's time you quit your job and come live with me. After the stunt you pulled with the cops. He pulled her into his arms, a bit roughly, shoving her into his chest until she could hardly draw a breath. Smoothing her hair flat against her head, he whispered hotly into her ear, I will take care of you. He knew how she felt about living together before marriage. It was against her beliefs. He once respected that. She was past questioning the drastic changes in Mike. Now all she wanted to do was escape. But he never left her alone long enough for her to even contemplate ways of doing it. She thought of telling Danny, her friend from work, but the timing never seemed right. Okay, Mike. She had to agree. She knew that now. See you soon. He released her and pinched her cheek, a dark grin on his lips as he looked her over. After he left, she sagged against the door, her heart palpitating out of control and pulled in large quantities of air now that she could breathe normally again. Tears shot down her face as feelings of humiliation and fear crashed over her. What was she going to do? Who could she tell? She felt terrified just being near him, terrified of his next move, of what he might imagine she was doing secretly. A dark cloud passed overhead, casting a large shadow through the sheer curtains of the windows. The shadow seemed like a foreshadowing of something worse to come. She sobbed, desperately needing answers, wishing someone could hear her cry for help and believing it was too late for anyone to help her now. Jenna was relieved when Monday arrived. She would be at work all day, surrounded by people who liked her, which also meant she would be able to keep her mind more occupied. Over the weekend, Mike contacted her only once, sending her a text to remind her of his undying love for her, but that he had prior engagements and would see her Monday night. She didn't know what he was up to because he refused to ever tell her, but neither did she care. Jenna was grateful she'd been free of him for two whole days. 
though much of that time she'd spent nerve-wracked anticipating his sudden arrival. He didn't typically leave her alone this long. Hey, Jenna! Danny greeted her as soon as she stepped into the building of Innovation's core. She wore her dark curls loosely. They fanned around her light chocolate face, making her look more like twenty years old instead of thirty. Did you and Mike set a date yet? Jenna used to tell her how she was sure Mike was the one, that by the end of the year they would probably end up getting married. Jenna stopped believing that after he left her stomach bruised on Valentine's Day last week when he first suspected she was cheating on him. Jenna only started working for Innovation six weeks ago, but she felt at home here. The CEOs Alec and Donnie dropped by from time to time. Like Danny and the rest of the staff, they treated her like family. Though she'd only known Danny a short while, they'd become instant friends. Good friends. Jenna had been shy her whole life, so it was never easy to make friends. But when she met Danny, they fell into sync, like they'd been close friends forever. Jenna? You and Mike set a date, right? Unable to feign her usual smile, Jenna shook her head. Danny cocked her head. You okay? She was sure she'd fall apart if she went into details about the current situation right now. <sighs> yeah, just tired. Jenna glanced in the direction of her desk where a pile of papers awaited her. And I have a lot of work to catch up on. Oh, of course. Have a good day, Jenna. Danny flashed a smile as she moved past her. Jenna was the company's technical account manager. She'd held the same position for half a decade at another company before they went under. She was thankful when she found out about the opening with Innovations. Danny headed the tech department as a software engineer. They'd hung out a handful of times outside of work. She was so easy to talk to, fun, sincere. Jenna had never had a friend she trusted as much as Danny. In fact, she considered Danny her only confidant. Maybe Jenna could talk to her after work one day this week. Jenna entered her office and plopped into her seat. If there was one thing she was thankful for, it was her job. Working with clients to provide a safe and secure environment made her feel more important and vital to the operation of innovations. She hadn't been able to help herself against Mike, but at least she could help customers with their own needs. Blaine struggled to keep his mind on work. He was scanning the new security policy passed down by HQMC, the headquarters staff, but his head was clouded by the restaurant incident. It had happened nearly two weeks ago, but for some reason he couldn't let go of the image of her face, the fear he'd detected in her eyes, or the threatening nature of the man with her. He clearly controlled the relationship. Shaking his head, Blaine worked to ignore his feelings of concern, but his chest bubbled with anger at the dark-haired stranger. Implementing new policies required extreme focus. He forced the memory away and concentrated on his computer screen, but the words on the screen blurred. He blinked, took in a long breath, and rubbed his hands together. This wasn't an ordinary plan he was working on. They had experienced a cyber attack earlier that morning. After Blaine analyzed the content of the malicious assault, he immediately reported it to HQMC. The Secretary of Defense had passed down the required changes right away. Fortunately, no information had been exposed, but he had to haul butt to ensure it stayed that way by installing new encrypted data immediately. Letting his fingers fly over the keyboard, he managed to send out a few recommendations on how to implement the policy before the hour was up. As he reclined in his seat to study the screen, confidence flowed through him as the details all seemed to pull together in a seamless, a defective plan of action. He hit save and forwarded the proposed changes to his commander. Tomorrow... Thursday, Blaine would be traveling to Malibu Bay, where he worked at Aesthetic Marketing as a copy editor. He met Elijah, his boss, during college, and after Blaine edited one of his assignments for him, he'd offered Blaine the part-time job. It was also the one day Blaine spent with his parents and then with Chase and Nina. He was looking forward to getting away from here. A new email appeared a moment later, his commander okaying the rough outline of the revisions. Blaine scooted his chair further in and continued the policy, spending the remainder of the afternoon finalizing the military's response strategy. He performed vulnerability assessments and finished the draft for the user changes response. After running a diagnostic, he verified there were no undetected breaches. Sending off the finished document, he powered off the computer and headed out to his barracks. Fortunately, his roommate was out. He didn't feel up to engaging in any conversation. 
his mind inevitably returned to the unknown woman. Since he did not have a habit of dwelling on women he didn't know, he hoped to either put her out of his mind or figure out why he was so fixated on her. He figured the likelihood of seeing her again was slim to none, since he frequented Gary's and had never noticed her or that slime ball there before. Which is why he felt befuddled by the fact that he couldn't shake images of her face. Sighing, he changed into an old t-shirt and loose basketball shorts and dropped onto his bunk. The night was young. The room was slightly stuffy, but he had no desire to go anywhere. He thought that after a few days he'd be able to put her out of his mind and get back to his same old routine. But here he was, with no desire to go out, to read a book, to watch a movie, the usual things he turned to after work. All he could think about was her. He tucked his arms behind his head and laid his head back on the pillow. His feelings connected to the memory of her were changing. In the beginning, he had been overwhelmed by anger at the bully, a simmering rage for the controlling monster. Now his emotions shifted into a strong desire to be her guardian, like it was his duty to protect her from her boyfriend as much as it was his duty to protect his country. The need to do something overpowered him. He glanced at the door. Should he go out? Shaking his head, he turned his gaze to his book collection on the mini shelf he'd built above his bunk. Maybe reading something would take his mind off her. It wasn't like he knew where to find her. The stress of work had probably caused him to get tangled up in the memory. Things left unresolved, even situations not directly related to him, tended to bother him. Blaine sat up and selected a title from the shelf. Opening the book, he nodded. That's what it was just his own unease about an unfortunate incident that didn't pan out the way he hoped. For a while, he was able to immerse himself in Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire, getting sucked into the lives of the well-known Star Wars characters and billions of galaxies proved delightfully easy. Until his stomach started growling. Placing the bookmark in the pages where he'd left off, he got up and went to the mini-fridge he shared with his roommate. Choices were slim a small jar of olives, some leftover chicken wings, and a container of strawberry yogurt. His body was hungry, but he had no appetite. Shutting the fridge door, he rose to his feet and stared around the room. The urge to leave, to make sure the woman was safe, suddenly overwhelmed him. He needed to go out. He couldn't stay here a moment longer. He had to find her. He snatched up his jacket, tucking his pocket knife into one of the pockets, and hurried out to his car. He didn't know where he was going, but he put the car in drive and headed north, downtown. San Diego lit up before him as he moved down the freeway. Several commuters traveled home, some looking for a reprieve from the long workday. A guy on a motorcycle swooped past him, knocking Blaine's heart against his ribs. Blowing out a tense breath, Blaine gripped the wheel harder. He needed to remain calm if he were going to help this woman at all. He shook his head. None of this made sense. The intensity of his emotions, the sudden need to find her. He felt almost ridiculous driving mindlessly down into the city, having no idea what he was looking for or where he should go. The possibility that Blaine would come across her in a city with a population that exceeded a million people was slim. After passing the next couple of exits, he decided to go back to base. It was useless searching for someone in a place full of people. Besides, the whole drive felt pointless. Nothing was pulling him in any particular direction. She could be at home right now. Or she could be with him. And then he felt a sudden tug to get off at the next exit. Heading to the off-ramp, his defenses flared up like the hackles of a dog who warns his owner of impending danger. Blaine didn't know yet where he was going, but the certainty he was getting closer to her overwhelmed him. As he made a right off the exit, he wondered at this moment, Something like this had never happened to him before. This being pulled towards someone. The time crunch. The immediate need for him to reach a destination. But he didn't question it. He was compelled to keep moving. His only explanation was that God was doing the directing, drawing him to wherever she was. And though none of this made much sense to him, one thing swiftly made itself known. The woman was in danger. His heart pounding in his ears, Blaine pressed down on the accelerator, flouting the speed limit as he whipped down the main road. 
His eyes darted over restaurants, toy stores, a gas station. To his left, the ocean expanded endlessly. He wasn't sure where she would be. She could be walking the beach or sitting inside a cafe. The possibilities were endlessly frustrating. He wiped a drop of sweat from his forehead as he continued west. There. The voice came from far away. It sounded so close. But it was all Blaine needed to know he was in the right place. He pulled quietly into the empty parking lot of an abandoned apartment complex on his right and threw the Honda into park close to the street so as not to alert anyone to his presence. Grabbing the keys, he jumped out of the vehicle and pulled on his jacket, switching off the dome lights and leaving his door open. Down inside the shadows, at the west end of the lot, sat the white car he recalled from the restaurant. He swiftly approached it and memorized the plate of the vehicle, tucking it into his mind for later. He doubted he'd be leaving tonight without another call to the police. He was with her. That fact hit him hard. But where were they? The brick building loomed before him, tall, at least ten stories, with multiple windows on every floor. They could be in any one of the many rooms, or somewhere outside, behind the building, hiding in the shadows. A few feet away, a pile of wooden platforms had been precariously stacked beside a large pile of trash. He looked to the right side of the structure to where a large dumpster was half covered in darkness. Next to it, under the sodium vapor of a dying streetlight, someone had dumped a pile of ratty clothes. Since no one lived here, he decided to peruse the outside perimeter of the old apartments. Stealthily, he made his way down to the far end of the building. The sunset had already faded into the black night, but sweat poured off his face as though the sun were blazing overhead. He pulled at the collar of his shirt to let some of the cool night air underneath it. He dipped his hand inside his jacket pocket and rubbed a finger over the handle of the knife. He hoped he wouldn't need it. He'd never had to use it before. But he would if the situation came to that. Not for the first time, he wondered at the powerful convictions running through him. A small noise echoed behind the building, like someone had kicked something like an aluminum can across the gravel. Blaine drew in a breath clogged with anticipation and readiness and took a step forward. A few seconds later, he rounded the corner and stopped just outside the dim light of the lamppost. He sensed movement from the corner of his eye and carefully swiveled his head to the left. A tall shadow, a man's, lurked near the other end of the apartments, and he was wrestling with someone. Muffled voices filtered through the thick air. Their voices rose slightly one of them female. Her. The couple faced away from him, and their discussion, if it could be called that, was quickly heating up. They hadn't noticed Blaine yet, so he was still at an advantage. Backing stealthily away, he edged around the front of the building and stalked toward the pile of platforms. The voices grew louder, clearer. The fiend was shouting now. I don't trust you, Jenna, and when I don't trust someone, it never goes good for them. I know, Mike, I know, her voice quivered. Blaine stepped around the platforms. He was close enough to see the outline of the guy, his large bulking biceps filling his shirt as he towered over her. Her face shone bright beneath the glow of the moon and the streetlight. Blaine's eyes locked on her. He saw fear as she stared at her partner, but more powerful than the fear was a desperate plea to be freed from the manacles of the monster. Blaine pulled back into the shadows and quickly dialed 911. The man's voice was loud enough to cover Blaine's as he gave a quick report of the situation, including the guy's license plate. Units were on their way. Blaine crept back to his previous spot, praying hard for the police to arrive before the situation grew any more dangerous. The man had let go of her. Jenna. She had backed away from him a few feet, but the fear held in her eyes, in her trembling hands that she twisted helplessly in front of her. What had changed in the short time he'd been on the phone? The fiend slowly advanced toward her, his shoulders squared off, his body tense, his steps menacing. Blaine was so close, he heard Jenna's shaky intake of breath. She backed up, but there was nowhere for her to go. Her body collided with the dumpster. Blaine turned his gaze back to her pursuer. The sicko was holding an object of some kind. Blaine moved closer, maybe ten feet away from the scene. He prayed that he would scare the guy off but not startle her. She needed to know Blaine wasn't another creeper. The moon glimmered and the man reached his arm up behind him, high into the air. 
The snake tattoo looked menacing as its rattlesnake head rose with the guy's movement. The object glinted beneath the moonlight, the blunt edge of a hammer. Blaine leapt forward, bolted alongside the building, and reached the monster. He threw himself on the perpetrator, knocking him to the ground. A righteous anger burned inside him as Blaine knocked the hammer out of his hand and pressed his knee hard against his chest. A streetlight, this one brighter than the other, shone down upon them. The sick bully tried to sit up but only managed to twist his neck at an awkward angle. Get the hell off me! He barked, his cheeks burning red. Blaine did not move his position, but he glanced over at Jenna. Her stare wasn't on her assailant, but on Blaine. The terror was dimming, and something hopeful glimmered there. The guy wiggled beneath him. When I get my hands on you, you're going to wish you never stuck your nose where it don't belong. Spit flew from his mouth as he roared at Blaine. The guy was striving to get free. His eyes flicked to the hammer several feet away. Blaine pressed his knee harder into his chest. No way would he give him a chance to grab his weapon. He hoped the police would be here soon. Blaine didn't know this woman, but he wished more than anything that she didn't have to witness any of this. He was sure she had undergone enough affliction in this sick relationship. The sooner the police arrived, the sooner this nightmare could be over. At least for tonight. And hopefully Chapter four. for the rest of her life. The wail of police sirens filled the night as Jenna watched the stranger pin Mike in place. She couldn't see Mike's face, but she didn't need to. She sensed it was rage-filled toward her and the stranger. Trembling, she scooted back into the shadows. Mike had never been humiliated like this before, she was sure of it. Whatever happened, she knew he would come looking for her and make her pay for cheating on him, even though she hadn't. And he would find a way to blame her for what this man was doing to him now. She swallowed and fought back tears. She hoped she wouldn't cry. Mike said crying only made things worse for her. She knew the price to pay would be another bruise on her body, somewhere discreet, where no one could see it. Get off me! Mike howled, his scream eerie like the cries of a coyote as it sought its prey. She shuddered. The unknown man had him pinned, but suddenly Mike was breaking free. He leapt at the man in a blind fury and wrapped his arms around his neck. Jenna cowered beside the dumpster. What if Mike crushed the man's throat? She closed her eyes, but she couldn't close her ears to the increasing scuffle. Slowly she peered through her fingers. The man had Mike on his stomach now and was using some kind of arm control hold. But suddenly Mike broke free and hopped up, fury boiling in his eyes as he attempted to wrestle the guy to the ground. No, no. Please don't leave me here alone with Mike. Mike grunted, his face dark purple with rage. The man thrust his arm up, swatting away Mike's grip. But Mike was fast, and he reached into his back pocket, pulled out his knife, and pointed it at the guy's neck. Pulling the guy's head back, Mike raised his arm and was about to plunge it into the man's throat when he jerked free of Mike's grip and whipped his arm straight up, knocking the knife out of Mike's hand. It made a dull thud as it hit the ground. Jenna sucked in a shaky breath and closed her eyes tightly. She couldn't bear to look. Was the situation about to turn deadly? What if Mike recovered the knife and killed him? Her cheeks felt wet with tears. She didn't care if it was a sign of weakness. She was terrified. Mike lost his grip on the guy and froze, his icy stare fixed on the other man. She trembled. His hatred was callous, full of bloodshed. The sirens blared loudly, piercing the air. Three patrol cars swept into the parking lot and parked a few feet away from the scene. Jenna gasped, instant relief flooding her. He must have been the one to call them. Maybe the police would take Mike to jail, and maybe he would stay there a while. The two fighters seemed frozen in time, watching each other, neither of them moving. Back away from each other! Hands up! An officer shouted, materializing out of the shadows. He held his gun in front of him, while the other two armed officers followed closely behind. The stranger complied immediately, but Mike backed away, his glare full of fury. I said hands up! the officer repeated. Stiffly, Mike raised his hands. A second officer trained her flashlight over the area, bright light casting a spotlight along the brick building, over a broken window, then down across the pavement. "'Whose weapon is this?' she asked, highlighting the hammer. "'Mine,' Mike grumbled, a death stare still flaring in his black eyes as they raked over the stranger. "'Ma'am?' 
She moved toward Jenna, holding the flashlight in front of her. Do you need assistance? Jenna's stomach twisted with anxiety as she forced her gaze away from the recent battle, and as the truth suddenly became terrifyingly real to her. Mike had brought a hammer with him, and he meant to use it on her. She choked back a cry. Tears rained down her face, but she couldn't stop them. Are you injured? Jenna sniffled. I... I'm okay. One of the officers was handcuffing Mike, whose body had gone completely stiff. As he escorted him to one of the police cars, Mike peered over his shoulder, his face stony as he threw one last look at her before he ducked under the doorframe. The officer was questioning Mike as he sat halfway inside the back of one of the cruisers. The other man was also cuffed and led by a second officer to another patrol car. "'Can you tell me what happened here?' the female officer was asking Jenna as she held open a small notepad. Jenna explained the situation, remembering every detail well. The moment, she knew, would be permanently imprinted in her mind. Right next to all the horrible things he'd done to her. She spoke so softly, struggling against the thudding of her heart, she wasn't sure if the officer had heard her. But she nodded, scribbling something down. Would you like to press charges? Jenna's whole body tensed. If she pressed charges, how long would he go away for? What if it wasn't long enough and he came after her? And this time, killed her. She glanced over at the man. He had saved her from Mike. The rage in Mike's expression had terrified her. And then he'd raised the hammer toward her, prepared to kill her. For the first time, she was more afraid for her life than she was of him. Ma'am? The officer stared intently at Jenna. She tore her gaze away and looked at the officer. Yes. Yes, I would. The officer nodded. We can also provide you with an emergency protective order. It's a temporary protection in the event you decide to file for a domestic violence restraining order. Jenna nodded and exhaled softly, slowly, the tension in her muscles slightly loosening, but the fear still pounding in her chest. What would happen to him now? To her? Jenna's gaze flicked to her rescuer. He was still speaking with the officers, his face serious. What was he telling them? Was he pressing charges, too? Jenna trembled as the female officer jotted something down. Ma'am, is there anything else you need? Do you have a way home? Um, no. Jenna shook her head and brushed a tear from her cheek. I came with my boy... Mike. His car. I can certainly take you home. Yes, thank you. She followed her to the patrol car and glanced behind her. Mike swung his legs inside the cruiser as an officer shut the door. The man, her rescuer was still conversing with the officers, but they had taken off his cuffs. His gaze flicked her way. She saw something in his face that made her heart tap wildly. Chapter 5. Compassion. Blaine's heart was still racing when he lay down in his bunk. The amount of adrenaline pumping through his veins had pushed his breathing rate beyond anything he'd ever known. It had taken him an hour to settle down once the fight with the thug ended. He'd notified his chain of command at once and had spent a good amount of time in his supervising officer's office with the JAG attorney as he detailed the incident. Never in his 35 years had he experienced a rush like this, a moment when he thought he might end up killing someone. The urge to end the guy's life had been so strong. It had taken all of his willpower to stay focused on preserving it instead. The sight of the woman's fear, of a woman who had long been abused by this insatiable monster, had torn at him. But by God's strength and protection, Blaine had maintained his composure. When he gave the police a breakdown of the occurrence, they were meticulous in their note-taking. Blaine had pressed assault charges. Hopefully she had pressed charges, too. For everything he had ever done to her. His stomach turned and bile lurched in his throat. He sat up and slowed his breathing. His need to hurt the guy subsided. He found a little comfort at the thought of the guy going away for some time. With any luck, he would be given the maximum four years for assault with a deadly weapon. But if she accused him of attempted murder, it would be at least twice that before parole. He hoped she wasn't too afraid to do it. He got up from the bed and went to the fridge, where he pulled out a bottled water. Slowly, he sipped the drink, attempting to calm himself. The adrenaline still coursed through his veins, but at a slower crawl now. Taking one long swig, he sat on the bed. His Star Wars book was on the nightstand. 
He wished the altercation he experienced earlier was just a fantasy, like Zahn's world. But it was a cruel reality. He wanted to confide in his parents and in Chase, but he was exhausted, and it was late. Besides, he'd rather tell them in person anyway. It was nearly midnight now. He needed to get some shut-eye. He had a long drive in the morning for his once-a-week copy editor shift in Malibu Bay. Sighing, he set the bottle next to his book and closed his eyes. He welcomed the change in scenery tomorrow. He rubbed a hand across his face and shifted onto his side. The fear in her eyes haunted him as he lay there. What had that sick predator done to her? And how had he snaked his way into her life? Blaine awoke before his alarm went off. An hour before it went off. He counted ten times he'd woken up throughout the night. It took him several minutes to get back to sleep each time. The little bit of sleep he did get had been riddled with nightmares, dreams filled with piercing screams, her screams, from far away. He'd been stuck in a tunnel, maybe ten feet underground, clawing at the sides, thick, muddy walls, slipping, crashing to the bottom over and over while her screams grew more desperate. At last he'd managed to climb out and dash toward the sound of her cries until, finally, he found her. With him. When he reached the sound of her voice at the end of a weed-infested field, her presence remained elusive. He saw her nowhere. But as he stared closer at the dead meadow, it turned bloody red. The bloodshed reached all the way to the streets behind the open field. He had been too late. He had jolted out of bed, wide awake, his whole body shuddering. It was a good thing he was heading away from San Diego for the day. Being here, right now, left him with a strong reminder of how the real-life nightmare of last night had nearly gotten her killed. He didn't know her. But for whatever reason, that fact meant nothing. God had put a desire to protect her in his heart. And he had done that. For now. Blaine's need to continue being her protector stayed with him. He wasn't sure why. The guy would be in jail, possibly for years. She should be safe now. But he felt more than just a need to keep her safe. Something moved within his heart that he'd never experienced before. Another need. A desire to be near her in her life, to be more than just her savior. Drawing in a deep, steady breath, he pulled on a long-sleeved button-up shirt and a pair of dark jeans. His legs still shook, and his heart rattled from the adrenaline spike that hit him upon waking from the dream. A change in scenery would help ease his mind, he hoped. By the time he arrived at Aesthetic Marketing, his nerves were still firing, not from the scene he witnessed in the dream, nor from his rage at her attacker but from a hope to see her again. After greeting Elijah and letting him know about his promotion, Blaine grabbed a cup of freshly brewed black coffee from the break room and made his way to his cubicle. Taking a quick sip of the brew, he settled into his desk chair and glanced at the pile of papers sitting beside the computer monitor. Apparently the fax machine had been busy all night and into the morning. The top paper showed a timestamp of 7 a.m. He definitely had his work cut out for him today. He ran a hand through his buzz cut, thankful for the distraction, anything to get his mind off Jenna. He'd helped her out of a precarious situation. There wasn't any more for him to do, so why couldn't he stop thinking there was? He hoped Chase could help him sort through his frustrating thoughts. Back in college, Chase had been there through Blaine's two relationships, the only relationships Blaine ever had. Neither woman had expressed interest in pursuing a serious relationship so both affairs had ended after only a few months. In his experience, Blaine's desire to date only someone he could see himself marrying was rare among the men he knew. Most of his buddies wanted nothing more than casual relationships. Most of them were afraid of commitment. But ever since he was a child and had watched the powerful love between his parents that had withstood major storms, he knew he wanted that kind of love, too. And he didn't want to waste any time being with the wrong woman. He pulled off the top few sheets from the stack on his desk and booted up his computer. A client had sent a request for a series of ads. Before it went to the design department, Blaine's job was to ensure the copy edit was clean. As the monitor came on, he glanced once more at the stack of faxes, hoping his mind would stay fixed on his workload. He needed a reprieve from the anxiety and nightmares that had plagued him, a moment to refocus and clear his head. 
He brought up a blank shell and duplicated the text from the proposed ad, cleaning up the grammar and spicing up the message with flavorful diction. He scanned the goal of the company's product, a new book publisher searching for romance authors, and chewed on his bottom lip as he contemplated just the right headline to catch the consumer's eye. Traditional publishing wasn't as hot as it once was, and getting new authors on board would prove a challenge. After letting a few different ideas marinate for several moments, he finally decided on a catchy headline. Their next request involved a tagline for the slogan the graphic designers would be working on. The publisher had given a rough idea for the creative image, which allowed him to better assess a corresponding tagline. Blaine leaned back in his chair and took one final look at his composition. Satisfied, he emailed it to the design department. Thumbing through the stack, he stopped on the last fax, which had come through within the last hour. He liked to tackle work as it came in, though some projects required immediacy. He opened his email and clicked on his unread messages, about ten in total, all of them requests from clients, some new, others repeat clients. An author they had worked with for the past year was requesting a video ad for her horror series. A church needed a batch of brochures for the month. A blogger wanted a whole new web design for his homepage. The church's needs were immediate, however, so he went to work on that project next. Inevitably, his mind wandered to Jenna again, and to him. He would be charged, but how long would his sentence be? Would he get early parole? Would he go after her again? He closed his eyes and sucked in a long breath. What good would it do to torture himself over the possibilities of what may or may not happen to them both? He couldn't allow these thoughts to darken his mind. She had to be safe now, finding comfort in family or friends. He prayed for her to feel safe and comforted, to be surrounded by friends and family who loved her. Elijah stood near his desk a moment later, holding a slightly bulging paper sack. How's it going? Blaine looked away from the monitor and flexed his hands. Good? Elijah held the bag toward him. Forget something? Blaine frowned. Uh, is that mine? Elijah smiled. It is, he handed him the bag. It's lunchtime. Blaine glanced at his watch, his eyebrows raised. Wow, it's after two. I had no idea I'd been working that long. He opened the sack. A wrapped burrito and a bag of tortilla chips from the Mexican place down the road waited inside. Thanks, man. I didn't see you in the lunchroom and noticed you'd been working your fingers to the bone. Just an extra token of appreciation. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And for the promotion you just got. Blaine finished crunching on a chip and stared up at his boss. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. He noticed Elijah seemed a little different, happier. How was New York? Good. Really good. Elijah's smile broadened. Wait a minute. Something's changed. Blaine set down his food. Well, you could say that my relationship status changed. I asked Michelle to marry me. Blaine stood and shook his hand. Congratulations! I'm very excited for you both. Thank you. Don't have a date yet, but you will definitely be getting an invite. Elijah nodded at the food. Enjoy! I will. Thank you again. And tell Michelle I said congratulations. Will do. Elijah left, and Blaine sat back down and bit into the burrito, savoring the spicy taste of the carne asada now just to get through another hour until he could talk out his concerns. Because he left the office early, Blaine had the luxury of avoiding a lot of traffic. A few minutes later, he pulled into his parents' driveway. The 1950s bungalow sat on half an acre. Their nearest neighbor lived several blocks away. He'd loved growing up here, with a sense of privacy, away from the hustle and bustle he now faced every day living in San Diego. Close by, the Pacific Ocean cast its afternoon waves. He could see the far distance of the sea as though it were endless. The security of childhood flooded through him. Inevitably, his mind went to Jenna. The desire to keep her safe filled him once more. He pulled open the screen door and lightly tapped on the door. His mother answered seconds later, drawing him into a hug and kissing his forehead the way she'd done since he was a young boy. Blaine, has it only been a week? Feels like at least two, he chuckled. Miss me that much, huh? His mother's hair was silver. She had never dyed it, insisting God had blessed her with a beautiful natural crown in her fifties. Despite all her friends keeping their locks tinted with color, his mother still looked younger than them. Her soft blue eyes lit up with joy as she smiled. 
I always miss my wonderful son. She looked over her shoulder and called out to his dad. Hank, Blaine's here. Blaine shut the door behind him and followed her into the kitchen, where the smell of chocolate chip cookies hit him. She pulled on an oven mitt and tugged open the oven door, bringing out a tray of freshly baked cookies with extra chocolate chips, just the way he liked them. As she set the tray on the counter, she turned to Blaine. I just can't get past how proud of you I am. Your goal of making Staff Sergeant came true. You worked so hard for it. She laughed as she glanced at the cookies. I don't know how else to celebrate, so I just keep making your favorite dessert. His dad joined them and patted his son on the back. Very proud of you. You both deserve the Best Parents Award. Normally, Blaine's voice would have come out a bit chipper, but a vision of that monster getting ready to attack Jenna tangled its way into his brain. His dad put a hand on his shoulder. Hey, you all right? You look a bit pale. Blaine nodded, gathering his wits. I'm okay, but someone else isn't. He ran a shaky hand across his scalp. His dad slid his hand away, his face full of concerns. Who is it, Blaine? I don't know her. The first time I saw her was at a restaurant a few weeks back. She was with some guy. He got a little hot-headed. I called the police. I haven't been able to get her out of mind ever since. Then last night, I felt God pulling me to her. What do you mean? His dad looked more intrigued than concerned. I was driving downtown, trying to get her out of my mind, but completely unable to. In fact, it was like God filling my mind with nothing but her. I felt this sense of urgency to find her right then. He swallowed, his skin twitching with a low-burning rage at the memory of what happened next. It sounds like something bad happened. His mother's forehead crinkled with worry. Blaine sighed. Yes, something bad did happen. She has this boyfriend who was abusive. I got there just before... He could use a hammer on her. His mother's hand flew to her chest as she gasped. He stepped toward her and laid a gentle hand on her arm. I'm so sorry, Mom. I just blurted that out without even thinking. She shook her head. It startled me, but I am thankful you are okay. How did you stop him from hurting her? He gave them the short story with the happy for now ending. His dad gripped his shoulder. Blaine, you did something big here. You saved a woman's life. Don't let what could have been upset you. The guy's put away. Blaine scratched the back of his neck. You're right, Dad. I just keep wondering where she is, if she's okay. It's... I can't explain it. I don't know why she's on my mind constantly. I haven't heard you speak this way about any woman before. Maybe there's something more here for you. Maybe your role in her life isn't over. His mother cocked her head, her blue eyes twinkling. What do you mean? Blaine asked. She means something to you, even if you don't know why. The tone in your voice is so expressive, gentle. You care deeply for her, even though you don't know her. That sounds like something God has put into your heart. I think she's right, son. Whatever is going on here, just continue to listen. Things like this don't happen for no apparent reason. Yeah, he looked at his parents. Thank you for everything. I gotta get going early tonight. Gonna swing by Chase's on the way home. Oh, good, his mother beamed. Tell him and Nina hello for us. I will. He kissed her cheek and hugged his dad. See you next week. When Blaine got to his buddies a few minutes later, he was surprised to see Nina wasn't around. She did freelance editing from home, so she was usually there. He couldn't remember a Thursday night when she wasn't here to greet him. She was as good of a friend as Chase. Chase answered the door in his pajamas, his beard a little scruffy. There were dark circles under his eyes like he hadn't slept well in days. Hey, man, you sick? Blaine asked as Chase closed the door behind him. Chase rubbed a hand over his mouth. No, just dealing with an issue right now. He headed to the kitchen. Coffee? Uh, sure, thanks. Blaine settled into his usual spot on the upholstered couch. Chase handed him a steaming mug and sat opposite on a cushioned chair. How's A.M.? You were mentioning an overload of new clients? Blaine sipped the coffee. Yeah, new clients with lots of work for us, which is good. Just very busy, too. Glad to hear it. Still riding the promotion wave? I couldn't be more thankful for it. Honestly, I feel pretty blessed. 
How's work going for you? I'm crushing it. Chase managed a weak smile. A lot of people have been looking to retire near the beach, so I'm selling mostly waterfront homes. That's great, man. Blaine's voice trailed off as his mind went to Jenna once more. Chase frowned as he set his mug on a glass table next to his armrest. Something wrong? You sound worried or something. Blaine repeated what he told his parents, emphasizing his growing concern for Jenna. No matter how many times he talked about it or thought it through, his feelings of worry and compassion continued to press into him, and he felt entirely helpless to do anything about them. And I had this nightmare. It hadn't crossed his mind during the discussion with his parents, but now it came back to him full force, her terrifying screams, the bloody field. Chase got out of his seat and sat next to Blaine. Whoa, that's intense. Blaine looked at him. It feels like a premonition now, like if I don't get to her in time, that maybe she'll end up... murdered. But you did get to her before he could do worse. This time... Tension kneaded deep into his shoulder muscles. This time? What's that supposed to mean? Didn't you say the guy's locked up? Blaine let out a long breath, his hands fisted at his sides and his heart pounding all over again, as though we were back in that dark alley, face to face with that monster. Yeah, he is, he sighed. I just wish I knew where she was, why I can't stop thinking about her. Maybe there's something more here than just you saving her. Blaine looked at his friend. Funny, that's what my mom said. When I met Nina, it was love at first sight. And for years, we rode that wave, anxious to see each other every day. He looked away, his shoulders tightening. Where is Nina? When he turned back toward Blaine, tears filled his eyes. There's been a lot of tension between us. You know, she had that miscarriage last year. She just had another one. Oh, man, Chase, I'm so sorry. It's tearing us apart. Whenever we try to talk about it, we end up fighting. But when we try to talk about something else, we can't seem to communicate in any meaningful way. The miscarriages color everything we do or say. They just hang over our house like a cloud of doom. His words came out choked and staggered. His chin dropped as tears spilled down his face. Blaine gripped his shoulder. I'm here, for both of you. What can I do? Chase swallowed and wiped at his face. We'll get through it somehow. He glanced at Blaine. Just checking in helps. Nina's at her friend's house. She's gone a lot these days. It's hard for her to be here. Too many reminders. I'll pray for you both. Maybe look into counseling? Thank you. We desperately need both. He attempted a smile. Whoever this mystery woman is, I think she needs you. And you need her. There's something in the way you talk about her that tells me this isn't over. I just wish I knew where to find her. But then again, she might think I'm stalking her if I did. Chase shook his head. Whoever she is, wherever she is, if this is meant to be something more than just a moment in time, you'll find each other again. I believe Chapter that. Chapter 6 With everything in my heart. Jenna was thankful for Danny. She always knew what to say and was there for Jenna at a moment's notice. After their shift ended, Danny joined her at a seafood restaurant down on the beach. The server took their orders and brought them tall glasses of iced tea. They sat at a window booth. The ocean view was spectacular. Jenna loved living in Malibu Bay and had missed this view ever since she started dating Mike. When her car broke down and was in the shop for a few weeks, he'd driven her to work and picked her up every day. After she got her car back, they would alternate meeting places, usually a halfway point. Since Mike lived in San Diego, he always expected her to be with him there. At first, he escorted around, making her feel like a princess. He would arrive with a bouquet of roses or a box of chocolates and whisk her away to his place where he would fix her a five-star meal. But as the months went by and his temper became more prominent, she realized it wasn't him making her feel special at all. He wanted to control her every move. It had been so long since she'd stopped to look at the sunset to fully take in the beauty of nature that she had to choke back tears. Jenna? Danny raised her eyebrows as she reached across the table to touch her hand. What is it? I just... I was... 
Oh, gosh, how was she supposed to even begin to tell her what had happened the other night? She hadn't told a soul. If her mom were still alive, she would have rushed to her for safety. But she passed away last year from a cruel bout of cancer that left her completely emaciated before it killed her. Her father left long ago, an abusive drunk who beat her mom into submission whenever she was out of line and who reserved emotional and mental abuse for his daughter. If her mom knew how Jenna had fallen into the same trap, she might have died from a broken heart instead. Danny, something really bad happened to me. It's Mike, isn't it? She shook her head of dark curls, her lips pinching as though she'd bitten into an extra sour lemon. Wait, how did you know? His attention to you hasn't been healthy lately. I've seen the way he looks at you, like he doesn't trust you, like he suspects something. I thought I was wrong. You seem so happy. But when I saw you at work the other day, looking scared, I knew I had to say something. Jenna flinched. She hadn't realized how obvious Mike's jealousy was. She felt humiliated. Hey, Danny said, her hand still holding hers. This is not your fault. Do not feel bad. This is all him. She wished she could believe that. What happened? Danny pressed. You have been extra quiet this week. She swallowed past a thick lump that had wedged itself inside her throat. It started when I didn't tell him about my day right away. He immediately assumed I was keeping something from him. He didn't like that. The waiter set a plate of crab cake bites on the table and left. Go on, Danny said softly. Mike took me out under the impression that we were going to celebrate our six-month anniversary, insisting he was sorry for his accusations and would never make them again. She took a sip of her drink and set it down. Instead, he tried to kill me. Danny's grip tightened. What? The police came. He's in jail. It's okay. What do you mean by it's okay? None of this is okay. Danny glanced around the restaurant. A few nearby patrons stared their way. She turned back to Jenna and lowered her voice. What did he do? Jenna told her everything, including the stranger who had pulled Mike off of her, how he was her savior. You don't deserve any of this. You know that, right? Danny was holding both of her hands now and watching her intently. If your mom were here, she would be ashamed of me, of my choices. No, Danny said sharply. She loved you with all of her heart, cherished you. A tear slipped past Jenna's cheek as she nodded. I know. That's why I feel like I let her down. She told Danny about her abusive father. You didn't do anything wrong here. Some sicko got a hold of you. He's entirely to blame. Not you. Danny's voice was fierce and firm. Jenna felt a blanket of comfort and fold her. The waiter brought their plates a moment later, and they ate in silence for a while. Jenna said, I wish I could thank him in person. I don't even know what he was doing there. I mean, Mike deliberately took me to some sort of abandoned alley with no one around. It's like this guy came out of nowhere. An angel. I agree. He sounds like an angel. Your guardian angel. Jenna wiped tartar sauce off her chin. I wish I could find him. Tell him what he did. Find out who he is and how he found me. She laughed, the first laugh without pain in far too long. <laughs> I haven't been able to stop thinking about him. That's understandable. He committed a heroic act, taking on a monster like Mike. Danny shoved a piece of salmon in her mouth. Yeah, but it's more than that. Like, he's not done. Huh? Danny looked up. I have this strong feeling we're supposed to see each other again, but in a different capacity, a good capacity. She shrugged. I don't know how to explain it. I've never felt this way about anyone. Danny set her fork down and gave Jenna her full attention. And what way is that? Like, I'll be safe with him, and he'll always be there for me. Maybe you saw him somewhere before, earlier that day? Were you and Mike out somewhere? Her mouth dropped open. Maybe that's why she had been unable to stop thinking about him. He seemed familiar because... She had seen him before. She nodded slowly as the memory came back. Yes, at Gary's a couple of weeks ago, that burger joint in San Diego. I saw him sitting at the bar. She swallowed hard. 
Mike made me look at him. He'd accused me of cheating on him with this man. She gasped as the realization of something crossed her mind. Danny leaned forward. What? What is it? It was him, Danny. He called the police that night. He must have called them at the restaurant, too. Wait, what else did Mike do? Jenna looked down at her hand, which was crumpling her cloth napkin tightly. He was hurting me, pulling my hair. She didn't want to talk about it. All it did was restore emotions of fear and the feeling of hopelessness, of being trapped. Just like when she was little and her dad's threatening behavior toward her mother kept Jenna quivering inside her closet, afraid to come out until she knew he'd finally passed out. These police officers came to the restaurant and started questioning Mike. She took in a slow breath. The stranger who called. He was sitting at the bar a few feet away. He must have seen the way Mike was getting rough. Danny was all serious. What did you tell the police? They did ask you to verify that Mike was hurting you, didn't they? Jenna looked down, shame rushing through her. That's the thing. Mike denied it. And so did I. Danny didn't say anything for a long time. When Jenna looked up, she was staring at her, silently crying. I almost lost you, Jenna. If it weren't for this guardian angel of yours, I would have. Jenna's body trembled. You're right. Danny reached over and took both of Jenna's hands into hers. I love you. You're like the sister I never had. Jenna sniffed. You too. Her heart warmed at the thought. They both grew up without siblings, but they had formed a bond in the past few weeks that cemented their relationship as though it were made by blood. Do you know when you'll hear about Mike's sentencing? Danny asked. Yeah, she said in a few days after he goes before the judge. Keep me posted, okay? Okay. If there's anything you need, a place to stay, a shoulder to cry on, anything, you let me know. Danny let go of Jenna and sat back. Jenna nodded. I will. She took one last bite of her filet. How are things with Donnie? Danny's dark brown eyes lit up. Fun and funny. Never a dull moment. Jenna smiled. You two are perfect for each other. Danny's face turned serious again. You will find that someone too, you know, and I will be there with you to celebrate the day. By the time she got to her apartment, Jenna felt exhausted. All she wanted to do was collapse into bed, but the kind stranger, her angel, permeated every inch of her thoughts. His short cut hair suggested a military cut. Was he stationed in San Diego? Or maybe he had recently gotten out. But what she really wanted to know was how he managed to get to that alley just in time. How did he know she would be there? That Mike was about to kill her? How did he know? Had he been following her? That possibility sent a shudder through her spine. But he hadn't been there to hurt her. Still, how had he known to find her, and just in time? She entered the bathroom and picked up her toothbrush. His eyes were the most memorable thing about him. Soft and sincere. He'd been looking directly at her. All she saw there was compassion. After she finished brushing her teeth, she slid into bed, pulling up the comforter until it came up to her chin. Would she be able to sleep tonight? She hadn't slept well the night before. Nightmares about Mike breaking out and coming after her plagued her dreams. As she tossed and turned, her mind went to the angel. His strong presence, his clear willingness to protect her. And he didn't even know her. A certainty hit her. It was no accident he'd shown up just in time. It was like he was meant to be there, to save her. Her heart beat with a confusing mix of emotions. Wonder gratitude, and above all, desire. A desire to know why he had risked his life to save her, and the desire Chapter to seven. see him again. With Easter coming up in a few more weeks, Blaine looked forward to the weekend with his parents. It was tradition for them to spend Saturday brunch at the beach and do an Easter egg hunt at home the next day. The latter was never too juvenile for him. Over a month had passed since he'd last seen Jenna, and he still couldn't stop thinking about her. She invaded his dreams, his thoughts. 
A few days ago, the investigating officer at the DA's office had called to alert him to the upcoming pre-trial for Mike Gleason, the monster he'd prevented from killing his girlfriend. Soon Blaine would have his chance to share his testimony about the nearly deadly situation. While that opportunity satisfied him, it didn't sit entirely well with him, not without knowing how she was. After work, he drove over to Gary's to get his favorite Hawaiian burger. He sat at his usual spot, but his usual bartender didn't serve him. A younger gentleman, who usually worked the day shift, was working tonight. Hey, bud. Where's Cindy? Bud wiped down the space in front of Blaine. She's out sick. She'll be back by the weekend, though. Oh, good. What do you be having? Blaine gave him his usual, and Bud punched in the order. Gary's was unusually slow. In the bar area, there were only two patrons aside from him. But his heart stopped when he glanced over to the booths near the entrance. There Jenna was, as beautiful and lovely as ever. But something about her seemed different. The two times he'd seen her, her face had been stained with fear. But now a sense of ease drifted across it. For weeks he'd dreamt about her, wondering where she could be, hoping she was safe. And now here she was, mere feet away from him. Now was his chance to talk to her again. He rose from the bar stool and slowly made his way over to her, feeling partly like this was only a dream, or that by the time he reached her table she would vanish and he would never see her again. It seemed he'd waited so long to find her. He hoped he wasn't only imagining her here. But when he stopped beside her, and her face lifted to meet his, he knew this was real. Her lovely, petite mouth opened, and her soft brown eyes shone with surprise. He hadn't considered what he'd say to her if they ever met again, and he found himself in an awkward position with no words coming to mind. It's you, she whispered. Her dark lashes fluttered and her beautiful eyes moistened. I never thought I'd see you again. His breath caught in his throat, and his heart raced from the conviction he'd felt all this time because she had uttered exactly what he'd felt all along. How are you? He finally managed to ask her. I'm okay. Her voice was meek, almost hesitant. He hoped his presence wasn't upsetting to her. She didn't know him. For all she knew, he could turn out to be another Mike. He would do anything to assure he was nothing like that monster. Is it okay if I join you? He asked. Her eyes flicked around the restaurant as she played with the salt shaker. Had he said the wrong thing? Was he moving too fast? The last thing he intended on doing was scaring her off. She looked back at him. Okay. Her voice came out with a little uncertainty. If it's too uncomfortable, she shook her head. No, it's all right. Give me just a minute. I'll go let the bartender know. He hurried back to his spot and pointed out his new location. Bud nodded to confirm. As Blaine slid into the booth across from her, his hands turned warm and his pulse quickened. He'd wanted this moment for so long he couldn't believe it was actually happening. Just to be near her, to see she was alive and whole, made his entire body flutter with excitement and relief. It was like he'd been holding in a long breath and could finally release it. A waitress set a tall glass of lemonade in front of her and left. I'm Blaine, he said gently. It's Jenna, right? I overheard your name in the alley. She wrapped her hands around the glass and pulled it closer to her as though protecting herself from something. Yes, she said, her gaze averted from his. It pained him to see her wary of engaging with him. Of course, just because he'd saved her from a life-threatening situation didn't mean she could trust him. She didn't even know him. He hoped he could change that. I thought you might be here she said after a moment. She did? I hoped you were, she explained. I remember seeing you here before. There was no other way to find you. She sounded happy to see him. That was a good sign. But there was a slight desperation in her voice, too, and that pulled on his heart. She took a deep breath and folded her hands together on the table. Whatever she was about to say seemed hard for her. Thank you from my entire heart, for saving my life. I don't know why or how you did. He froze. His breath stopped. He didn't expect her gratitude to affect him so intensely. 
He had felt compelled to do something, called to do it. But it wasn't just that he had to do it, he had wanted to do it, which is why her words stirred inside his heart so deeply. Of course, Jenna. As crazy as it sounded, he knew he would do anything to keep her safe. That night, I told the officer what he did, all of the things he did to me. Because of you, I pressed charges against him. You gave me a second chance at life. His heart thudded wildly. I got a call from the DA's office. She paused as she stared down at her hands. There's a court date coming up. I hope they will put him away for a long time. I got the notification, too. I'm going to testify against Mike, he said. Her head whipped up, her eyes widening with fear. You are? Why? He didn't expect that kind of answer from her, as if she still couldn't fathom someone standing up to Mike, much less defending her. Maybe the subject matter was too much for her. He was about to change the direction of the conversation when she spoke up. Why were you there that night? I mean, how did you know I would be there? Have you been following me since you saw me here last time? Blaine swallowed past what felt like a large stone that had lodged itself inside his throat. No, I haven't been following you. I've been thinking about you, though, hoping you're okay. Boy, that sounded creepy. It's not at all how he meant it to come off. He cleared his throat. I don't fully understand it myself. The best answer I can give you is that I felt pulled to find you. She pursed her lips. Pulled? What do you mean? He blew out a small amount of air and chose his next words carefully. He wasn't sure how she might take what he was about to say. I live on base here. I'm in the Marine Corps. After work that day, I was driving around when I felt a call to reach you. God spoke to me. He urged me to find you like my life depended on it. He watched her, wondering if she thought he was crazy. To his own ears, the whole thing sounded impossible. She looked at him with curiosity. You believe in God? Yes, I do. I hope you don't think I'm a creep or a stalker. I know it might sound... I believe in God, too. She took a sip of the lemonade as she rolled her eyes away from him once more. My mom did her best to instill good qualities in me, assuring me God loved me even when my father... Her voice dipped. I thought I was going to die that night. He fisted his hands together, the anger toward Mike rising to the surface of his heart. If he'd showed up to the scene one second later, she would have died. It was so dark. I've never been so scared in my life. Mike doesn't play games. He always means what he says. He said it was time for me to die. She choked up, her velvety voice ripe with fear. He reached over, his hand brushing her arm. She quickly withdrew it. He took his arm back, feeling like a fool. The last man to touch her had abused her physically and had been close to killing her. He had no right to touch her. She stared at him now, her beautiful brown eyes aglow. Her voice was a whisper. Then you came, like a light into the darkness. His heart thundered wildly, a flood of warmth filling him. If it weren't for you, I would be dead. Her eyes glistened with a mixture of pain and relief. He's been hurting me for months. I never thought it would come to him wanting to end my life. Fire coursed through his veins. Hopefully, he'll stay in jail a very long time. His voice was rough and raged. It was good the guy was in jail, because if Blaine ever saw him again, he might do something regretful. He'd prayed hard to not let such thoughts overwhelm him. Jenna's head dipped, her hands sliding from the glass. I want to testify against him at court, but I am so... Afraid to see him again. I can understand that. Do you have a good friend you can bring for support? Slowly, she lifted her head until her beautiful eyes were on his. Yeah, I do. And you will testify against him? This time, instead of surprise, he heard hope in her voice. He nodded. Absolutely. A tiny smile caressed her lips. Good. His voice softened as he said, 
I'm glad you're okay, Jenna. I know we don't really know each other, but you've been on my heart all that time. I've prayed for you to be safe, to find happiness, to be in a place where you know you are loved. Slowly, she raised her head, her lips parting. I think I'm getting there. His heart swelled at her words, but something from the corner of his eye caught his attention. He glanced to his left near the bar. Bud stood still, his eyes locked on Blaine's, but the second he'd turned, Bud resumed his movements, pretending to be absorbed in his bartending duties. Was he just imagining Bud's interest in him? Had they just happened to look at each other at the same time? Not wanting to concern Jenna, he quickly turned back to her. Blaine, I am so thankful to you for what you did. Thankful for... Her voice broke as tears slid down her cheeks. His chest seized with the need to comfort her. But he wouldn't touch her or do anything to push her further away. She sniffed. I'm sorry. No, please, there's nothing for you to be sorry about. She picked up her napkin and blew her nose. Again, he saw movement, the feeling of someone watching him. He flicked his eyes behind Jenna and let them slowly wander across the sea of faces before landing on Bud. Bud was glaring at him, but when he caught Blaine looking back, he shifted his focus to a customer. This couldn't be a coincidence. The look on his face was unmistakable. But why was he staring at him like that? Bud had waited on him a small handful of times over the years, and Blaine had never picked up any strange vibes from him before. He'd always treated him with the same dignity he showed all of his customers. Blaine looked away and kept his attention on Jenna. The waitress had brought their meals, and Jenna was biting into her burger. He picked up his own burger and took a bite, but his speculations over Bud's odd behavior erased his appetite. He dared another glance his way. This time, Bud was serving a customer, but his dark eyes locked on Jenna this time, and he did not avert his gaze for several seconds. What was going on? What had happened to make Bud look at him like he wanted to fight him and now be fixated on Jenna? As Blaine tried to savor his food, he thought back to his visit here when Jenna and Mike had patronized the restaurant. Bud had been working that night, but Blaine's attention had been elsewhere, mostly on Jenna. Had Bud been eyeing both of them then, too? Why? What had changed? Did Bud's strange behavior have something to do with Jenna and Mike? Did he know them? What are you thinking? Jenna brought him back to the present. He glanced at her and set his burger down. He wasn't going to lie to her, but he also didn't want to worry her. Just thinking about that evening when you and Mike came here. It was you who called the police then, too, wasn't it? Yes. Thank you. Her fingers curled around her glass. But something is bothering you. You keep looking all around like you expect something bad to happen. Do you know Bud, the bartender? Her eyes shifted to his work area, though Bud must have been on a break, as he was nowhere in sight. She nodded faintly. Yeah, he's one of Mike's friends. Blaine's heart jumped. He is? Yeah, I don't know him all that well, though. She started playing with her napkin, her hands slightly shaking. He gives me the creeps. He's always watched me with those beady eyes of his like he's preying on me or something. I tried to tell Mike, but he shut me down. She shook her head and released the napkin. I'm telling you too much. I need to learn to be quiet. No. His voice came out sharper than he expected. He softened his next reply. Don't ever feel like what you say doesn't matter. It does. She looked at him for a few seconds as though assessing whether he was being truthful. Her face dropped, sadness filled it, and she resumed eating. Worry ransacked his brain. Something was very wrong. Bud and Mike were friends. Mike was in jail, and he couldn't hurt her anymore. But why was Bud fixated on him and Jenna? She said he'd looked at her strangely, like a predator. And he'd seen it for himself just now. When they got to the parking lot a short while later, they discussed meeting later in the week, and he gave her his phone number. Call me if you want to discuss the court date, or if you need a break from thinking about the court date, he said. Okay, thank you. He walked her to her car, where she suddenly froze, her eyes wide with terror. What's wrong? Blaine asked. He joined her. A slip of paper had been taped to the window, a message scribbled on it in dark black ink. We're always watching. Don't touch it, Blaine cautioned. Jenna swallowed and glanced at Blaine. He took out his phone and dialed 911. 
As they waited for the police to arrive, he could see how spooked she was. The feeling was mutual. Do you think it was Bud? he asked. Is this something he would do? She looked warily toward the restaurant, though they were at such an angle that the bar was not visible. I used to think he was just weird, off a bit. But the more I saw Mike's true colors, the more I stopped making excuses for Bud, sugarcoating who he really was. Her gaze swung back to Blaine. Yes, this is something that he's capable of. A patrol car pulled up a moment later, and a young officer got out, greeting them both. He plucked the note off the car with gloved hands as he asked them a few questions. Jenna told him about Bud and the situation in the alley, and how tight he was with Mike. The officer thanked them for their time and left them his card before he took off. Jenna looked once more toward the restaurant before tearing her gaze away. She was shaken up. Blaine hoped she'd be able to find a way to be at ease tonight. Will you be all right going home? Blaine asked her as he held open her door. She nodded as she slid into the driver's seat. She looked up at him. Thank you for calling them. Again. A tiny smile appeared as she shook her head. Hopefully the next time we see each other won't involve any law enforcement. He laughed. I'm with you on that. Good night, she started the engine. Good night. He backed away from the car and waited until she was safely on her way toward the freeway. He hoped he'd get some Chapter restful eight. sleep tonight. Jenna's whole work day went smoother than she thought possible. Usually, she came and did her job and did it well, but she hadn't enjoyed it. Not when she spent the time ruminating over Mike's concerns about her supposed infidelity or wondering what he would accuse her of doing next. For the first time in months, she could breathe freely, her body wasn't tense with dread, and her gait was light. Well, you look awfully chipper today, Danny remarked with a grin as she passed her on the way to the break room. I do? Danny laughed. That's a good thing, Jenna. It's been too long since I've seen you smile. She was right. It had been far too long. Jenna's mouth felt heavy with the smile. She would have to get used to the sensation of smiling again. But it was her heart that wouldn't stop fluttering at the image of her angel, Blaine. It worried her more that she had no desire to stop it at all. Cupcake? Danny held out a chocolate-frosted cupcake with a little yellow candle stuck on top of it. Happy birthday, my dear friend. I know you don't want to make a big show of it, but you can't expect me not to do anything. They were the only two people in the room, lunchtime not starting for another hour. Most of the small staff worked at the other end of the building. Oh, Danny, you remembered. Of course I remembered. I slaved away at these all last night. Jenna's eyebrows raised. You didn't have to do that. I know. She licked some frosting from her finger as she dropped another cupcake into her friend's open palm. But I had to. You had to? Jenna bit into the sweet treat. Well, yeah, any excuse to have chocolate. Jenna shook her head as she took another bite. Wow, this is so delicious. I didn't know you could bake. Only on special occasions and only for special people, she winked at Jenna. Thank you. She wanted to say more, but any words she might utter seemed inadequate somehow. Danny plopped into a chair at the long rectangular table, and Jenna sat across from her. Okay, so what's the story with your savior? How did things go yesterday? Danny wiped some frosting off her chin as she wiggled in her seat with anticipation. Again, her heart leapt at the mention of him. He had done so much for her, saved her life. No one had ever committed such an act for her. Even last night, his will to keep her from harm was evident. It went really well. Her heart swelled at the memory. It had been amazing. She told Danny all about how this angel in her life still cared for her to the point that he was willing to testify against Mike. It wasn't just his words, what he said he would do. It was how he looked at me, like he would do anything to ensure I would always be protected. But more than that, to be there for me, like a really good friend. Danny stopped wiggling in her seat, her hand paused in midair as it clutched a wadded-up napkin, her mouth dropping open. Wow. Jenna smiled. Yeah, wow. I have to meet this guy. Wait, what's his name? Blaine. Danny set her napkin on the table and sighed. Just like in Pretty in Pink. Did you know that's how I look at Donnie? Well, at first I saw him as Ducky, but as I got to know him, I realized he was actually Blaine. 
Jenna arched an eyebrow, totally confused. Danny shook her head and chuckled. Never mind. My point is that Blaine is an awesome guy in the movie. He's a keeper. But I'm not looking for someone romantically. Does it matter? Because from the look on your face, your heart is already yearning for him. Jenna opened her mouth to argue the point, but clamped it shut again. Danny knew her well. She was right. She was already falling for her angel. Hearing it said out loud confirmed the desire that had been roiling inside her heart. Well, I'll check in with you after work to make sure you haven't floated away. Danny jumped up and smirked at her. Okay, Jenna smiled back. Danny must have forgotten she was holding a cupcake in her hand because it crumbled in half, some of the frosting spilling onto her shirt. Drat! Jenna stifled a grin as she got up and went to the sink to dampen a towel. She handed it to her friend. Oh, thank you. Danny patted at her top as Jenna stooped with another paper towel to scoop up the crumbs. How are things in accounting, anyway? Danny asked as she rubbed off what chocolate she could. Pretty good, she rose. I have an appointment with one of our customers to show him how to use the software package he just purchased for his video editing company. Nice. Well, see you after work. Okay. Jenna deliberately didn't mention Bud. She knew it would take a lot out of her and rattle her a bit, and she certainly didn't want to fall apart at work, much less in front of a client. A few minutes later, Jenna went over the productivity software with a business owner, pointing out how to manage timelines and deadlines and how to collaborate with others in the creation of a project. After she finished helping him, she pulled up her emails, all client-based queries, and answered them with detailed support. It felt good to do something normal, something familiar. It took her mind off Mike and Bud and boosted the good feelings Blaine had unknowingly brought into her life. She wanted to call him, but she didn't know what to say. How did you communicate with the man who saved you from your worst nightmare? After finishing her follow-up with a few other clients, she opened the document report of the sales performance metrics. Most of the columns showed increases in growth. Alec and Donnie would be pleased. A short while later, she met Danny out front. Oh, I'm so glad it's the weekend. Do you have any plans? Danny swung her sleek, dark purple purse over her shoulder as she fell into step with Jenna. No, but... She shuddered, Bud's angry face flashing in her mind. Danny halted and placed a hand on Jenna's shoulder. What is it you're not telling me? She looked at her friend and wondered how to start. I never told you about Mike's friend Bud, but he's always had his eye on me. Danny's body tensed. What do you mean? He's always watched me, like he wished he were the one with me and not Mike. I didn't think too much of it until now. She explained how he'd kept watch at Gary's last night. But Mike trusts him. He never noticed. She swallowed as she considered another possibility. Or maybe he didn't care what his best friend was doing. Danny's voice became hot. Just what does that mean? Danny, you don't belong to Mike. Not anymore. He can no longer touch you or hurt you. This bud guy can stare at you all he wants, but he can't touch you. Jenna couldn't erase the cruel look in Bud's eyes from her mind. But what if he sends a message to Mike? Danny opened her mouth to answer as Jenna's phone twittered. She pulled her phone from her purse and glanced down. Blaine was calling. Hold on, it's Blaine. Hello? Hey, how are you? A spark of excitement rushed through her at the sound of his husky voice. I'm okay. Are you free tonight? Would you like to meet again? We can go over the court date and some other things. She looked over at Danny. Um, yeah. Gary's again? I don't think that's a good idea right now. How about Jumpy Joe's, that Mexican place down the road from it? Okay, sounds good. Six o'clock okay? Perfect. See you soon. Shoving the phone back in her purse, she looked at Danny. We're meeting for dinner again, to go over the court date. Let me know how it goes. See what he thinks about this thing with that bud guy, too. She cocked her head. So do you know what Blaine does for a living? Actually, he told me he's stationed at Miramar. He serves in the Marine Corps. Danny's dark brown eyes popped out. Wow, Jenna, a Marine! A dimple formed in Danny's cheek. Blaine sounds like a winner. Tell me you exchanged numbers. He gave me his. Danny squealed. Jenna shook her head. 
I don't know why you're getting so excited. I mean, the man I thought I would marry ended up hating me and trying to kill me. How can I even think about having another man in my life? Flashing back to Mike's grimace as he advanced toward her with the hammer sent an icy chill through her entire frame. A wave of nausea caused her to stumble backward. Danny rushed toward her and grabbed her arm. Hey, take it easy. She steered her to Danny's car and gently leaned her against the door. I'm so sorry for suggesting anything, Jenna. Her face was an oval of concern as she peered into Jenna's face. No, it wasn't that. I was remembering the way Mike looked in the alley. The murderous intention behind his eyes. Oh, Jenna. Danny hugged her tightly and wiped a tear from her own face. I love you. I'm here for you. Tears poured out of Jenna as she nodded into Danny's sleeve. I know. I know you are. Thank you. Danny stepped back but took hold of Jenna's hand. No thanks necessary. Just know I am here for you and so is Donnie. Call me tonight with an update. Don't hesitate to call me if you need anything at any time. I will. She sniffed and squeezed Danny's hand. Jumpy Joe's was bopping with La Bamba at high volume and the smell of fresh tortilla chips. Jenna spotted Blaine waiting near the hostess stand. He was watching one of the many TVs strung across the restaurant. If at all possible, he looked even more handsome than before. It didn't help that he was in the military. She'd always had a secret infatuation with men who served their country. Their willingness to sacrifice themselves to protect Americans was, to her, one of the sexiest traits a man could have. As if he sensed her presence, Blaine slowly turned and faced her. A sweet smile spread across his mouth as he moved toward her. It's nice to see you again, Jenna. He stopped just short of her, as if remembering how uncomfortable his touch had made her the other day. You too. Party for two? The hostess asked. Ready? Blaine checked with Jenna. She nodded and followed him to a corner booth near a window. Your server will be by shortly. Enjoy! The hostess left. What's your favorite dish here? Blaine asked as they opened their menus. The bean and cheese burrito. My tastes are pretty plain. He glanced at her. For the first time, she noticed the color of his eyes. They were crystal blue and soft as they watched her. And she couldn't help, nor did she care to stop, the way her heart jumped like a bolt of electricity shot right through her. I like simple. He smiled and went back to his menu. The way he said it made it seem like he wasn't just talking about food. Her heart zigzagged like a wildfire. She needed to calm down. If this is how she reacted to the look in his eyes and to a simple thing he said, she didn't know how much longer she could contain herself. After the server took their orders a moment later, Blaine told her about his upbringing in Malibu Bay and how close he still was to his parents. It was nice to listen to him, and she felt herself relax. He shared a little about his family trips to the beach. He asked her if she liked the beach, though he shied away from asking her questions that were too personal, as if he sensed from her an unwillingness to divulge information too intimate. But as they talked about little things, like her favorite movies and music and how much she liked the beach, something about him made her want to share with him. He reminded her of Danny in that he was both open and trustworthy. She felt safe around him. But it was more than that. Blaine's attentiveness toward her was genuine. He respected her space, responded to what she said with interest. Even the way he thanked the server was kind. When Mike showed any resemblance of decency toward others, his irritation and impatience was always thinly veiled. And while she'd felt special for a while, deep down she knew Mike was only appeasing her. He always chose what they would do and when they would do it. But she had been so happy with the attention he'd given her, unlike her father, who spared little time with her and only to belittle her, that she ignored the red flags. Jenna longed to tell him how she'd always been close to her mother and how painful her recent death hit her, how the mental and emotional abuse her father inflicted upon her must have been evident, how Mike must have smelled the fear in her and used it against her. The temptation to share so much of herself scared her. She hardly knew him, yet she felt like she'd known him all her life. Before she could contemplate that further, he asked her about Bud. 
He hasn't bothered you again, has he? No. Her body went rigid at the mention of his name. What is it? Brown lines appeared on his forehead. I can't escape Mike. Even now that he's in jail, he still has eyes on me. I'm under Bud's watch now. After our conversation about him, I put a call into the police. They'll be checking him out. Even if he does attempt to call Mike, all of his calls are being monitored. He won't be able to do anything at Mike's bidding. She gripped the straw and swirled the ice cubes around in her glass of ice water, staring as they clinked against each other, feeling surprised and comforted all at once. Finally, she let go of the straw and slowly peered over at Blaine. Thank you, she whispered, tears of relief choking her. But a renewed sense of fear gripped her. With Mike out of the way, I think Bud will try to fill in for him somehow. That's one reason I didn't think we should go back to Gary's. Does he know where you live or work? No, he doesn't know me, not really. Just with Mike and only when we came into the restaurant. Just stay away from there. And if he contacts you at all, call the police. She nodded, a rush of warmth filling her. His gorgeous blue eyes softened as he gazed at her. How could someone who hardly knew her Chapter care nine. so much about her? When their food came, Blaine was surprised by how hungry he was. He hadn't had much of an appetite lately. But now that he was with Jenna, could see firsthand that she was indeed safe, he found himself returning to his normal self. It hadn't just been his appetite that changed. His sleep continued to be riddled with strange dreams, not reminiscent of the ones filled with blood and death, but ones where Jenna walked only a few feet ahead, yet no matter how fast he chased after her, he could never reach her. How do you feel about the court date? he asked. I'm ready for it to be over, he nodded. I can understand that. I'm sure it will be a relief for you. He realized how much of their conversation inevitably centered on unpleasant topics. He hoped to change that. Jenna had been badly wounded. He was sure Mike had done so much damage she might think she could never recover. Blaine's desire to protect her hadn't changed. In fact, it had steadily grown into something more. He had to remind himself that just because he was falling in love with her didn't mean she would reciprocate those feelings. And if she didn't, he would be okay with that, for he would be able to come away knowing he had saved a life and brought some sort of balance to her world where she realized that good men still existed. As he finished the last of his burrito, he chased it down with some cold water. He wasn't ready for the night to end. He wanted to do something to bring joy into her life, Whatever happened between them, he didn't want their relationship to be defined by Mike, for the only thing they had in common to be his court date and jail time and that dreadful, nearly fatal night. Jenna? She looked up from her plate, her fork paused in midair. Would you like to go bowling with me tonight? She raised her eyebrows, seemingly taken aback by his suggestion. But then her angelic eyes softened. That sounds like fun. Her lovely smile lifted the shadows from her face. I would like that. His spirits lifted. He wanted nothing more right then than to see her happy. A short while later, they entered the downtown bowling alley. They had to wait twenty minutes for a lane to open, but Jenna didn't seem to mind. They found a table for two near the snack bar. Would you like something from the snack bar? He said. Sure, I'll take some red vines. You got it. He made his way to the counter and purchased the licorice for her and a Snickers bar for himself. They sat at a table, munching on their candy. There was so much about her he wanted to learn. He grew excited thinking about it. He'd never wanted to know somebody as much as he wanted to know her. When their lane opened up, they searched for their respective balls and met each other a moment later. Ladies first, he said. She picked up her ball and crept over to the line. Her shoulders heaved and her back straightened as she lifted the ball slowly in front of her. Pulling back her arm, she carefully balanced the ball before bringing it forward and lightly tossing it down the lane. The ball rolled swiftly, and seconds later it knocked all ten pins down. Jenna turned, a gleam in her eye. Wait a minute. You know how to play? You didn't give off that impression. She smiled slyly. You never asked. He couldn't argue that. He hadn't asked. He picked up his ball and made his way to the end of the lane. As he drew his arm back and let the ball drop forward, he knew this wouldn't be a strike. The ball struck seven of the pins. 
He turned to see Jenna clap for him. He shook his head and grinned. Blaine was typically on the competitive side, but he didn't want to win against Jenna. He just wanted to win her. He threw down the second ball, and it ended up in the gutter. Jenna got up to take her turn. Another strike. She took her seat and looked at Blaine. You're amazing, he said. Were you ever in a league? No, my mom and I used to bowl a lot together. Her voice got quiet, and he detected sadness in her face. She's gone now. Cancer. Blaine stepped over to her and sat beside her. I'm sorry. He slowly reached his hand toward her, but hesitated. Would he be crossing a line if he touched her? He took his hand back. She looked at him from beneath her long lashes. Her right hand slid over her knee, closer to him, inches from his own hand. Slowly, carefully, he moved his hand next to hers. She didn't move. The pain in her eyes shone strongly, but something else lived there, too. A longing for something, as if searching for the reassurance that she wasn't alone. Or maybe he assumed too much. What are you thinking? he asked. She drew in a deep, shaky breath. I miss her. It was so hard to see her go. He waited quietly, not wanting to do anything to keep her from sharing her heart. When I was a kid, we used to do a lot of things together. The park, the beach, bowling. But when my father used to come home drunk all the time, it meant the fun was over. She moved her hand back to her lap, and he folded his hands together. He would hit her right in front of me. He got a kick out of it. He reserved a special kind of abuse for me. He often told me how worthless I was, how no one could ever love me. Blaine felt her pain as though it were his own, like a punch in the gut. She laughed, but it was morbid, sarcastic. <laughs> he was right. Mike ended up being everything my father told me I deserved. You don't deserve what happened to you. Don't ever think that. You are precious. A single tear rolled down her cheek as her pretty eyes looked his way. My mom would be so disappointed in me. My father left us when I was nine. She did everything to make sure I knew I deserved to be special. Then I fall into the same trap. He so badly wanted to comfort her. He tentatively reached for her hand. She didn't pull away this time. You are free now. He can't hurt you anymore. And your mom would be proud of you because you survived it. And now you can live again. Her eyes shined with beauty and satisfaction. Because of you, she squeezed his fingers. Thank you. She looked at him, another tear sliding past her lips. Slowly, he reached out, and with the pad of his thumb, he gently wiped it away. Her beautiful face was painted pink from the tear stains. Why do you care so much about me? Why is it important to you to see me? She said. The heat in their touch allowed him to open up. He no longer worried about sharing his heart. He knew in order for her to trust him, he had to be honest with how he felt. I haven't been able to forget about you. I told you before how God led me to you. At first, I thought my role in your life would be short-lived. I arrived at the scene in time and knew you were safe when they arrested him. But as the weeks went by, it didn't seem like our time with each other was over. He swallowed and hoped he wouldn't scare her away. Now, I find myself wanting to be near you even more. Like there's something more between us. That was too much. He shouldn't have said that. Not yet. He watched her for signs of discomfort, but she only looked at him in amazement. He stared down at their intertwined hands. She was trembling. He had scared her. He released her hand and rose. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I should take my turn. No, she said so softly he almost didn't hear her. He turned around. She was looking up at him. I'm glad you told me. That was out of line. It doesn't matter how I feel. The last thing you need is some guy trying to get close to you. He took in a breath and slowly released it. I will be here for you if you need me. As a trusted friend, when you need someone to lean on. It's okay, 
her meek yet lyrical voice interrupted his concerning thoughts he shook his head adamant no i had no right i upset you she folded her hands in her lap but they were still shaking i'm so sorry he breathed excuse me for a moment he took off in the direction of the men's room grabbing the sides of the sink basin he checked his reflection in the scratched-up mirror all he wanted was to see her safe and happy and here he'd managed to conjure up more fear. Of course she'd be afraid for a man to touch her again, and the last thing on her mind would be the search for her next boyfriend. He couldn't ignore his feelings for her, but he could deny them. He smacked his fist against the porcelain sink as his head slumped forward. He had to go back out there. He had to keep his feelings at bay. He could do that. This wasn't about him. It was about making sure Jenna was okay. No, not okay. Good. Very good, able to breathe again and live again. He drew in a deep breath and let it fill his entire being. Jenna was checking out the scoreboard when he returned to the lane. She looked away and smiled at him. She was no longer shaking. Are you okay? he asked, praying she was. Yes, her tender voice made his heart skip a few beats. It's all he needed to hear. Blaine? Yes. I was shaking when you said what you did because I feel exactly the same way. Like there's something more between us. He hadn't expected that. His heart stopped for a second. You do? Yes, except it scared me. I've never felt this way before, this good about being with a man. They stared at each other for a long moment. They stood a few feet apart, but it was like nothing stood between them. She pointed to the ball return, a small smile pasted on her face. It's your turn. Her voice sounded like soothing music to his ears. He picked up his ball and rolled it down the lane. A split. Typical. When he turned around, Jenna was clapping, a smile gleaming in her eyes as though he'd just made a strike. His heart swelled with pleasure. It was more than he could have asked for. They played two more games with Jenna beating him by an embarrassing three-digit number. As they strolled to the parking lot, he said, You never told me you were secretly an official pro. She grinned. If I had, would you have still taken me? I would have. She blushed. Call me if you'd like to do this again. Whenever you're ready, he said. He didn't want to push her as much as he hoped she'd want to see him again. When she looked up at him, her eyes were sweet, her face soft and porcelain, like a precious angel. He felt his defenses crumble, not because of their conversation, but because he knew his heart was hers. He hoped she Chapter would 10. want it one day. Jenna had to force herself to look away from the sincerity and compassion in Blaine's eyes before her heart flip-flopped its way out of her chest. Thank you for tonight she said as he opened her car door for her. He stood back a good foot from the door as if making sure he respected her space. I had a good time. Thank you. In the driver's seat, she put her hands on the wheel and bit her lip. Blaine had been so good to her. Again. And she didn't want this day to end. She wanted more days like this. Days where she felt free, where she could breathe easily, where she didn't have to worry about what wrong she might commit next. I hope to see you again, Jenna. She looked up at him. His face shone with kindness, and his blue eyes glittered in the moonlight. Because nothing intelligible came into her head, she simply repeated, Thank you, and started the engine. As she drove home, her hands tingled with a new kind of energy. The rush of feeling cared for, of being cherished, as short-lived as it thus far was, felt overwhelming and wonderful. She'd had such a wonderful night. It was hard to believe it really happened. She felt close to Blaine, like no matter what she said or did, he would be there for her. But that realization scared her, too. How could she be feeling something like this for a man she hardly knew? She'd heard it said that strangers brought together under extreme circumstances formed bonds of intensity and closeness like no other. That fact most definitely resonated with her. This stranger, this man who didn't know her at all, had risked his very life for her. But he was still here for her, if she wanted. It wasn't just about saving her life. 
and she felt closer to him than she'd ever been able to feel with any man. Jenna choked back the truth of that as she drove past the beach, nearing her home. The pounding of the surf matched the frantic beat of her heart. The thumbnail moon bathed the dark surface of the water in its glow. She never tired of the ocean's beauty. It was a constant reminder of God's love. She'd grown up here, been raised by a mother who did her best to make her feel loved in spite of the abuse her father inflicted. The many beach trips she and her mom had taken when he left brought back memories of happiness and freedom. She pulled into her driveway and wiped an errant tear from her cheek. Unlocking the door, she fought back more tears. She missed her mom terribly. The woman who had taught her to believe in love, even after she'd never found it herself. With the door shut behind her, Jenna threw the keys to the sofa and sucked in a deep breath. She imagined what life would be like were her mother still here. What would she tell Jenna? Would she encourage her to let Blaine into her life a little more? Jenna wanted him in her life. In her heart, she knew he was a what-you-see-is-what-you-get kind of man. He didn't play games or do things to appease her. Mike had been sugary sweet in the beginning, acting like he cared for her, and she had been so eager for a male's attention she'd chosen to ignore the signs how his act was merely to benefit him, making empty promises to keep her enslaved to his sick plans for her future. Jenna gasped as she stumbled forward and braced herself against the kitchen island, her phone flying to the end of the tiled counter, her heart a thundering mess. What was wrong with her? Blaine treated her with dignity, with kindness. Why was she thinking about Mike? It did somewhat make sense the more she pondered it, because the court date was nearly here. Her phone rang. She wiped her face, full of tears, and picked up the phone. Danny. Jenna? Yeah, hold on. She managed to squeak out as she hurried to yank a tissue out of the tissue box on the small table behind her. She blew her nose and cleared her throat. The phone pressed to her ear. She cleared her throat. Hey, Danny. Hey, girl, you all right? You were supposed to call me after tonight. I know, I just got home. Danny clicked her tongue, a giddy eagerness filling her voice. Oh my goodness, you had a good time, didn't you? In spite of herself, Jenna smiled. You could say that. Is it too late for me to swing by? Jenna laughed at how anxious she sounded. No, come on over. While she waited for Danny's arrival, she used the bathroom to wash her face before going into her bedroom to change into an old pair of sweatpants and a loose t-shirt, her usual pajama wear. Jenna felt something she hadn't ever felt for a man before. A quiet longing. The beginning of a sweet intimacy. Someone she could trust with her heart. Her breath caught in her throat at that last thought. Even as a little girl, when she'd watched her favorite Disney princess movies, her dreams of a prince included a man who would be handsome and charming and stay with her forever. And Mike had met those qualities. It was too bad she never thought to dream of someone who would be good to her, too. Her body crumbled as she grabbed the edge of her bed and forced herself to sit before she fell. She felt sick to her stomach over how she'd let Mike into her life. He was hardly different from the abusive father she'd grown up with. Or had she been so willing to find her prince charming she willingly wore blinders? No, Mike had just been really good at disguising his true intentions. She whimpered as a torrent of tears rained down. The doorbell ringing snapped her from her dark thoughts. Wiping the back of her hand across her wet face, she hurried to the door. Danny was bouncing on her heels as Jenna spotted her through the peephole. As she swung open the door, Danny practically knocked her over with a hug. I can't wait to hear all about it. Donnie and I were watching a movie, but I was driving him nuts wondering what happened tonight with the Marine. Her giant grin was contagious, and Jenna couldn't help but smile back. Danny frowned at her as she dropped her car keys on the coffee table. Hey, why have you been crying? Danny lightly touched her shoulder. Oh. <laughs> Jenna groaned, feeling a confusing combination of fear and longing. I guess just everything that's happening. The court date's almost here, and I'll be testifying against Mike. Her entire body trembled at the thought of seeing him again. Danny squeezed her shoulder. You want me to go? You would do that? 
Of course I would. And Blaine is testifying, too? Jenna nodded as Danny handed her a tissue for her nose. I had such a good time with Blaine. She immediately started crying. Whoa, hey, sit down. Danny guided Jenna to a kitchen chair and sat in the adjacent bar stool. After a moment, when Jenna's tears were spent, Danny gently said, If you had a good time, why are you so sad? Because, oh, Danny, I can't even feel completely okay with him touching me. All he did was brush against my hand and I freaked. That's understandable, Jenna. I'm sure I would react the same way. It is? You would? Absolutely. So tell me about your night. We had dinner. He took me bowling. Is he good at bowling? No, she smiled. But I am. Danny raised her eyebrows. And how did he take his defeat? Jenna could still picture how happy Blaine was for her, how losing hadn't bothered him at all. Like a true gentleman. We had a lot of fun. He asked me to call him if I wanted to do something with him again. Are you going to call him? I mean, do you think you want to? She pictured his beautiful face, the tenderness there whenever he addressed her, the way he cared about her, gave all of his attention to whatever she was saying. Danny laughed softly. Drat. What? Jenna frowned. You have definitely fallen for him. Jenna felt heat spreading across her cheeks as her heart thumped eagerly. It was scary to feel a desire for someone, but not because Blaine scared her. She finished filling Danny in about the rest of their time together. He seems to think pretty highly of you, Danny said. You think so? Well, I wasn't even there, and I can tell how much he likes you. Her words brought an unexpected thrill. Jenna wanted Blaine to like her. Danny left a short while later after hugging Jenna and reminding her she was here for her, no matter what. But once she was alone, Jenna wondered how realistic it was to think something good could happen between her and Blaine. Jenna wept that night because she didn't deserve Blaine. It wasn't fair to let him feel something for someone who was damaged beyond repair. She would be calling him, not to spend more time with him, but to let him know she wouldn't be able to. The sooner she did that, the sooner he could move on with his life. The next morning, just before noon, Jenna punched in Blaine's cell phone number. He answered on the first ring, almost like he'd been waiting for her phone call. Hi, Jenna. His voice sent tingles throughout her body, but she had to stay focused and tell him why she'd called. Except every time she opened her mouth, the words refused to come out. Jenna? You there? Um, yeah. Is everything okay? Yeah. She needed to tell him. Now. But it didn't feel right. Instead, she surprised herself. Do you want to go to the beach? Malibu Bay? It's a nice day today. On days like this, my mom and I used to spend the afternoon just lying around on the beach. What was she doing? She was supposed to be putting a stop to seeing him, not inviting him in even more. Sure. That sounds great. I'll come pick you up. What time would work for you? Her heart thudded crazily. How about an hour from now? That works. See you then. She hung up and stood there for a moment, stunned by what she'd just done. Last night she had felt so undeserving of someone like him. But something in her was changing. It seemed okay, way more than okay, to open up her heart to Blaine. Like God was right here with her reassuring her. Malibu Bay was mostly barren, probably because the spring air was cool and crisp. Most people flocked to the beach when temperatures were high, but Jenna didn't mind. She wasn't big on crowds. She liked Blaine a lot. That truth still scared her, but maybe getting to know him more could change that. Yet she couldn't help wondering if he wouldn't even be interested in getting closer to her, especially when she was so damaged. As they set out their beach towels on the cool sand, she kicked herself for backing out of her original plan. She should have told him it was time for goodbyes, so he could move on with his life. Instead, she was dragging out the inevitable. I brought us some snacks and drinks. Blaine was watching her with a smile as he pointed to a small cooler. 
Thirsty or hungry? Her stomach growled despite her intent to tell him no. She nodded. His smile broadened like he was excited over doing this small act for her. He handed her a package of crackers with cheese and a bottled water. Thank you. Her hair whipped around her face as a breeze funneled past them. He squatted on his towel and dug through a beach bag for something. She sat on her own towel and opened the crackers. He pulled out a bottle of sunblock and offered it to her. Thank you. She took it and applied it to her arms and face, then her legs, wondering when she would get the courage to tell him things between them were over before they could ever really begin. Her heart hurt just thinking about it. How could she feel such sadness over a man she'd known for such a short while? You know what will be fun? He asked, breaking her out of her miserable thoughts. To go bowling again. I'd love to learn from a pro. He winked. She shook her head in disbelief as she handed him back the bottle of sunblock. What's wrong? He asked, setting down his bottled water. Why would you be okay with that? I mean, the guys I've known hate to be one-upped by a woman. His face pinched, and his blue eyes flickered with something akin to disappointment. Sorry you ever experienced that. She'd never known a man like Blaine. He was real and humble. How could someone be so good, so kind? Did you want to go into the water? It's probably a bit chilly, but if you want to, I don't mind. He gestured toward the sea. She glanced at the waves, rolling gently to the shore. A couple of kids frolicked near the shoreline, laughing as they tossed a ball back and forth. Glancing back at Blaine, she said, Sure, why not? He got to his feet and waited for her. She set her snacks back in the cooler and followed him barefoot down the cool sand. The spray felt cold even before they dipped their feet in the water. A trail of goosebumps ran across her arms. Do you want to head back to our towels? He asked, eyeing her prickled skin. I'll be okay. She stepped deeper into the water, letting it reach past her knees. She stood there shivering, wondering why she felt the need to go in further. The ocean felt like ice on her flesh. Even her teeth were chattering. Blaine moved next to her and slowly spread his right arm out and wrapped it around her shoulders. This time, she didn't jerk away. His touch felt like a heated blanket, so comforting it warmed her all the way into her heart. No, this wasn't right. She had to tell him right now. She turned so that his hand slid from her shoulder. Blaine, this isn't fair to you. I can't go on like this. I mean, I like you so much it hurts. She took in a breath, waiting for her heart to stop stammering. Why had she just blurted out her feelings for him like that? Now he had every reason to run away. It's okay, whatever you need to tell me. He coaxed her to go on. Blaine, I'm damaged beyond repair. I'm no good to anyone. I can't expect you to waste your time on someone like me. May I? He extended his hand toward hers. She swallowed and moved closer to him. His fingers slid easily between hers. She shivered, not because of the cold or because she felt fear, but because she could feel in that single touch a love she'd never known. Jenna, he said softly, it's never too late to be healed. That stopped her heart for a second. Could that really be true? Was he just being nice for her sake? You're not damaged beyond repair. God loves you. With him, we are never too broken. And this heart of yours is meant to be protected and cherished. You really believe that? She responded through a mirage of tears blurring her vision. He used his other hand to tenderly wipe the tears from her cheeks. His face moved closer to hers. His breath felt warm. The smell of his skin was pleasant like a musky cologne. He hesitated as his eyes watched hers. She slowly closed the space between them, and then his mouth was cradling hers, so lightly it felt like the tickling of a feather. Yes, he mumbled against her lips. Her eyes were closed, her body shuddering with surprise and eagerness. His fingers brushed across her cheeks and down her neck. It all felt so perfect. But she couldn't allow this to go any further. She pulled back and sniffed as more tears rushed out. Why are you here with me? 
His beautiful, tender face appeared confused as he reluctantly drew away. Jenna, I've been pulled toward you since that day in the restaurant. I never knew it would come to this. He paused as though trying to pull together the right words. I didn't know my feelings would turn into something more for you. But they have. I know I scared you at the bowling alley when I was trying to explain them. I'm sorry for that. But she wasn't scared now. What feelings? She prompted him. I like you, Jenna, in a way I've never felt for a woman before. It doesn't seem like a fleeting thing to me. It seems like something greater than I've ever known. He clamped his mouth shut, his hand tensing in her grip. She wondered if he was as scared as she was, and then she felt her whole body tingle with wonder and amazement, because the way he described his feelings was identical to the way she felt about him. Again. But why me? I mean, I don't deserve someone like you, someone good. He frowned as though he couldn't wrap his mind around her words. He shook his head. Don't ever believe such lies. He gently tilted her chin up. Jenna, you were meant to be loved. He dropped his hand and took her other hand in his. Waves slightly rocked them as they stood face to face, holding hands. The ocean felt cold against her legs, but inside she felt so very warm. When they returned to their spot in the sand, they spent the next several minutes in silence as they finished their snacks. The court dates on Tuesday. Are you ready? He asked. As ready as I can be, I suppose. She sighed, secretly glad Blaine would be there. Even though there would be a lot of space between Mike and her, Blaine's presence felt like a wall of protection, like it had that horrible night. My friend Danny will be there, too. I'd like you to meet her. She's been so good to me. I look forward to it, he smiled. The questions she'd wondered at countless times still prickled her senses. Why had Blaine saved her? No man in her life had willingly gone out of his way to do anything good for her, and certainly never been anxious to risk his life for her. And Blaine, a man who didn't know her at that point, did that very thing. He wanted to. Maybe she was asking the wrong question. He was a Marine, and she wanted to understand his motivations better. Maybe the Marine Corps was where she should start. Blaine, why did you join the military? He looked up from finishing his crackers and brushed the crumbs from his hand. A spark flickered in his beautiful blue eyes, turning them flame-like. I've been blessed. My parents are amazing. They have always had such confidence in me and my abilities. They instilled in me a self-confidence I have carried with me ever since. Beyond that, the certainty in my capabilities led to a passion to accomplish something, so I joined. I wanted to give back to others, to my country, to protect it. His voice drifted away as his gaze explored her face. Her heart leapt with awe as the pace of its beat pinballed throughout her body. How long have you been in it? Going on ten years. I got promoted a few weeks ago. I'm Staff Sergeant Carter now. Congratulations. Do you like to write? He asked. The question threw her off. He laughed. <laughs> Sorry, that seemed to come out of nowhere, didn't it? I'm asking because I work one day a week in Malibu Bay doing copy editing for this marketing company. I used to write a lot of poetry before work took over. I got my bachelor's in English a few years ago after I joined the Corps. Wow, not only did he spend his time protecting America, but he was also a writer? That was something they had in common. And that amazing kiss that was still making her entire body shake with excitement. I love to write, too. I'm not any good at poetry, though, she said. She used to write a lot, but when Mike demanded all of her free time, her stories fell to the wayside. What do you write? Blaine asked. Mostly short stories. What kind of stories? He seemed genuinely interested. It was weird opening up like this, talking about a hobby that she had only shared with her mom. She peered down and swirled a finger in the cool sand as a light breeze tossed her hair over her face. At least she could hide behind it for the moment. Mostly dark stuff, kind of like Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is my favorite, he said. Really? She lifted her head to look at him. Oh, yeah. The man's mind was magnificent, imaginative, insane. They both laughed. <laughs> For sure, she agreed. 
I would love to see your writing sometime, if that's okay. Again, her body reeled with a mixture of shock and pleasure. Blaine truly wanted to know this special side of her, and she wanted him to. Okay, she finally said, but only if I get to see your poems. It's a deal, he grinned. Her heart slammed into her chest as he looked at her. She had fallen heart first in love. Chapter 11 Blaine Carter. Blaine smiled, his heart full as he hung up with Jenna. They'd made a date, an official date, to meet at the mall with Danny and Donnie. What's with the goofy grin? Chase teased as Blaine ended the call. Blaine had spent the morning with Chase and Nina, telling them all about Jenna and their time together, as well as the upcoming court date. The tension was strong between Chase and Nina, though, and it hurt Blaine to see it. They'd always been so happy, a real team, but now just being in the same room together proved challenging. Blaine groaned at his friend's remark. That obvious, huh? Oh, just a little reminiscent of our times as teenagers when you have your first crush. Okay, I'm not that bad. He ran a hand through his fresh haircut. But she's been hurt. I don't want to create any more reasons for her to never trust again. Don't give up. Just be patient. Be there for her. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> but you really need to work on that puppy love look. I think it's sweet. Nina adjusted the crocheted afghan on the back of their living room chair for the third time. Fidgeting with something was her way of dealing with stress. I hope things work out for you and Jenna. I would like to see you find someone. She managed to smile. Thank you, Nina. That means a lot. Of course. She rose on her tiptoes and pecked Blaine on his cheek. She was petite, barely five feet tall, and with Chase a full foot taller, their physical differences stood out. But they were a striking couple, matched perfectly. Nina stepped into the kitchen, avoiding being around Chase. Chase sighed as he watched her go. Blaine quickly redirected his attention, hoping to give his buddy a reprieve from the seemingly hopeless state of his marriage. Thanks, Chase, for your encouraging words about Jenna. Shaking his head, Chase turned back to his friend. Here I am, able to help you sort out your love woes, but I can't even fix my own marriage. A pang stung Blaine's heart as if the pain of their marriage belonged to him. Hey, don't talk like that. This is temporary. Things will get better. Don't stop believing that. Chase nodded. I appreciate that, man. Blaine got to his feet. Well, I better go. We're meeting up at the mall in a few minutes. And they had agreed to share their writing, too. He didn't add that part out loud. Hoping this eases us into the trial tomorrow. Both of us will be testifying against Mike. Nina returned to the living room. Good. I hope he goes away for a long time. I'm glad you can be there for her. She managed a weak smile as her long, dark hair partially curtained her face. I'm praying for both of you, Blaine said. I'm here for you always, okay? Nina hugged him, and Chase patted his back in a partial hug as they walked him to the door. The mall parking lot was so packed, Blaine had to circle it several times before somebody finally decided to leave. Already a few minutes late, he sprinted toward the entrance and arrived at the food court. Jenna sat at a long table, her hands folded as she glanced around her. He halted, his breath catching at how beautiful she looked. Everything about her made his heart go wild. Her kindness, humility, and integrity were as endearing as her external beauty. She was breathtaking in every way. Jenna looked up, a tiny light glowing in her eyes as she spotted him. Hi, Jenna. He walked over to the table. Hi, Blaine. Was it normal for his heart to leap at the sound of his own name? Danny and Donnie went to get their food. They should be back any minute. I wasn't sure what you wanted, so I thought I'd wait to order. Whatever you want is fine with me. Oh, no, she protested. I'm sure you have a favorite restaurant. Actually, I'm not too picky. I'll go for anything. Oh, well, you know me. I'm pretty plain. There's nothing plain about you. He didn't mean to say that out loud. If only he could take back the words. But a lovely smile appeared on her lips. Thank you. Well, hello. A young woman with springy curls that matched her springy step set a tray of food on the table. A broad-shouldered man with a sunny expression set down another food-filled tray as he came up beside her. Blaine, this is Danny and Donnie. Jenna introduced them. 
Without hesitation, Danny extended her hand toward Blaine. He stood to shake her hand and was surprised by the vigorous pump she gave. So good to meet you. You too, Danny, Blaine said as they let go. He turned to Donnie, who was chuckling at Danny's reaction. Nice to meet you too, Blaine. You too. They shook hands and Blaine sat back down. Well, what are you waiting for? Go get some food. Danny plopped onto the bench and started in on her pizza as she nudged Jenna. The wink she flashed her didn't go unnoticed by Blaine. Jenna's gaze met Blaine's, and they simultaneously rose. Wherever you choose, he urged her as they started toward the west end of the row of restaurants. Okay, if you insist. A tiny dimple appeared on her cheek as she smiled up at him. He wasn't going to be able to concentrate on ordering his food if she kept looking at him like that. But that was okay with him. A few minutes later, they were back at their table with juicy burgers and salty fries. The four of them made a lot of small talk before bringing up the court day. Do you need to practice your testimony? Danny asked her. She shook her head. No, the more I think about it, the more rattled I get. I know I just need to take a deep breath and let it out, then just go in there and say what I need to say. Danny squeezed her hand. I'll be right beside you. Thank you, Danny. Jenna shifted her gaze to Blaine. Oh, that's right. Blaine is testifying too, isn't he? Danny said. Yes, he is. Jenna's eyes sparkled as she watched him. That's really good of you, Blaine. I mean, everything you did. Donnie set down his drink and fully faced him. If it weren't for you, we probably wouldn't all be here right now talking about any of this. Truer words about the situation had never been spoken. That fact still rattled him. To think if he hadn't been called to Jenna. But he refused to let his mind go there. She was alive. She was okay. Maybe even better than okay. And he was fortunate to be a part of this journey with her. How's Big Bear? Jenna asked Donnie. Well, busy, but Malibu Bay is certainly starting to boom. You two are doing great. Alex sends his gratitude from the mountain. Oh, you all work together? Blaine asked. Oh, sorry, yes. Donnie chuckled as he ran a hand over his closely shaved head with an intricate design on each side. Alec, my best friend, and I started innovations over a decade ago. Our corporate offices are up the hill. We opened a branch in Malibu Bay at the beginning of the year. Danny has handled our location like a champ, Jenna said as she playfully elbowed her. Blaine loved watching Jenna relax. Clearly, she enjoyed their company and could be herself, unafraid. She deserved to have happiness in her life. Well, it certainly couldn't thrive without your expertise, Danny playfully elbowed her back. After a bit more banter, Donnie and Danny headed out. I brought one of my stories to show you, Jenna said so softly Blaine almost didn't hear her. Oh, right. He pulled out a piece of folded paper he'd tucked into his back pocket. Did you want to go first? Yeah, I think I just want to get it over with. She sounded nervous. A light pink blush colored her cheeks, making her appearance even more breathtaking. I brought a one-page story. It was the first story she'd written in months, she explained. She began to read. He leaned in, embracing the lilt of her voice as she captured the essence of her Poe-esque tale. When she finished, goosebumps covered his skin. Are you sure Poe didn't write that? He asked. The pink in her cheeks turned a soft red. I'm sure. I was swept up in the villain. He actually gave me the chills. She stared hard at him. Really? Really? Well, then, I guess my work here is done. She cracked a smile. You have an amazing imagination. Poe would be proud, too. Her blush deepened as she stared down at her hands. Do you want a refill? No, thank you. She continued looking down at her hands. Maybe all this had been too much for her. Well, I had a really nice time today. See you bright and early in the morning, he said. No. She glanced up at him as he rose to his feet. Oh, sorry, you don't want me there? No. I mean, yes, I want you there. But no, we're not through here. It's your turn. She nodded at the paper he still held in his hand, his poem. Oh, right. How had he forgotten? He sat back down, unfolding the notebook paper and spreading it across the table. As he read it to her, his words from a long time ago when he first considered confessing his feelings for a woman back in college, it occurred to him how much the emotions didn't capture those he now felt. 
The uncertainty and confusion that plagued him then seemed foreign to him now. What he felt for Jenna was free of that turmoil. It was pure and certain and full of hope. That was incredible. Do you still write poems? she asked. Not in a while. I'm a bit rusty, he sat up. What are your plans for Easter? he asked. Nothing this year. It was always my mom and me before. What about you? My parents and I spend the morning on the beach, and we actually do an egg hunt at their house on Easter. That sounds wonderful. He hoped it wasn't too forward to ask her to join him. Having her there would make his day. It seemed right. Would you like to join us? Why? Not the reply he expected. I would love to have you there to celebrate, and I know my parents would too. And after what we're about to deal with here tomorrow, it will be very much needed reprieve for us both. He held his breath before he said too much more. There were so many things he wanted to tell her, he could hardly contain the growing affection in his heart. She stared at him, her mouth curving up into a smile. Chapter 12 I would love to. Jenna checked her pants pockets for her keys for a third time before she locked her car door. It wasn't that being rattled was unfamiliar to her. Mike had put her through many terrible things these past few months. Feeling rattled had been an ongoing state of mind. Yet now she would have to go in there and face him one more time. Testify against him. She looked down at her hands. They were shaking terribly. Blowing out an anxious breath, she headed toward the courthouse. Jenna? Blaine's voice halted her, and she spun to face him. He had come, just like he said he would. She felt happiness and relief flow over her. How are you doing? He asked as he stopped beside her. He was wearing his dress blue Charlie's. For a moment, seeing him in his uniform made her forget how much she dreaded going in. His chest was thick and strong as it filled out his shirt. His muscled arms hung straight at his sides, arms that had protected her. He looked incredibly hot. But reality kicked right back in. Nervous? Very nervous, she said, eyeing the municipal building. Understandable. Do you want to talk about it or go over anything? She sighed. No, I just want to get this over with. I hear you. What about you? Are you nervous, like me? Just looking forward to seeing justice served, and to see you free of this burden. Her heart danced with the amount of selflessness he continued to convey. She still couldn't wrap her mind around his desire to think of her first, to do whatever it took to make her feel comforted. She'd never felt safe her entire life until now. Blaine had no idea how much he had already changed her life for the better. There you are! Danny sounded out of breath as she jogged up to them. Had to park across the street. We have only five minutes to get inside. Jenna jumped. Oh no, let's hurry. Danny grabbed her hand. It's okay, we'll make it. She jerked her head toward Blaine. Hi, Blaine. Good to see you, Danny, he smiled. The three of them made their way inside. The courtroom felt cold as they stepped into the witness room with the prosecuting attorney. Jenna wished she'd brought a sweater. They all sat at a round table. The attorney didn't waste any time. The note that was left on your car, the police were able to access cameras that night at the restaurant. It was Bud who left the note. Although she'd been quite sure of that, knowing it was the actual truth sent chills down her spine. Police were able to get a warrant and search his place, the attorney said as she opened the file on the table. Danny gave her a reassuring smile, but Jenna received a shock a moment later when the judge called someone to the stand. Bud. Jenna choked back the nausea that rose in her throat, hyperventilating as she struggled to stay still in her seat. The attorney's voice was calm and encouraging. Jenna, Bud admitted his part in Mike's plan. For months he kept track of your whereabouts. Police had found plans in Bud's computer that pointed to collusion with Mike. Plans detailing your schedule and mapping out the point of attack in the alley, and a plan B in the event didn't pan out. That's why Bud's out there, to elaborate on his part, and to accept the charges for what he did. Jenna grabbed her friend's elbow and rested her head on her shoulder. It's almost over, Danny whispered so faintly Jenna almost didn't hear her. God couldn't have surrounded her with any more protection and support than these two wonderful people by her side. Danny reached out to squeeze her hand. 
Jenna interlaced her other hand in Blaine's. Several minutes passed. Jenna's pulse wouldn't stop racing. Where was Mike already? As if in answer to her question, a correctional deputy emerged from a side door of the room, guiding Mike, who was wearing leg chains and waist chains, his face a mask of bitterness and anger. Goosebumps covered Jenna's skin, but not because of the temperature of the room. She shuffled closer to Blaine, who sat on her left. He leaned down to her ear. It's okay. We'll get through this. It will be over before you know it. The snake tattoo she'd always hated seemed to glare at her as Mike was taken behind the defense table, and Jenna felt like he was strangling her. She gasped and quickly looked away, grabbing onto Danny's arm. I'm right here with you. It's okay, Danny whispered. Okay. But she didn't feel okay at all. She looked up at Blaine. All she saw in his eyes was compassion for her. It will be all right. He can't control you any more, Jenna. He caressed her left hand with the pad of his thumb. She wrapped her hand inside his, feeling a renewed sense of victory and comfort. Her best friend Danny and Blaine sat on either side of her. Who was Blaine to her? He wasn't just her savior. No, he was more than that. She... she loved him. It's time, the attorney said to Jenna. She nodded and, with Danny at her side, followed the attorney into the main court area. The judge entered the room wearing a long, flowing robe, her gray hair pinned into a loose bun. Her face looked friendly, and she soon proved to be a quick-to-the-point type of judge. Jenna felt like she was having a strange, out-of-body experience when it came time to share her testimony. Like it wasn't even her talking, but someone else, maybe God helping her through it. She took the court through the entire six months leading up to the incident. It hurt to cover all that ground. Rehashing it brought back so many horrible memories, but she kept going, pushing through the vivid dark moments that had controlled her for so long and the way Mike had intended to kill her that night. Knowing that every single detail, how his actions along the way led into his plan that night, would possibly help her case and put him away for a long time. When she was finally done, and when she returned to the witness room, she felt all the air within her body deflate as though she were a helium balloon. You did wonderfully, Danny whispered to her. Jenna squeezed her hand in gratitude. She's right, Blaine added, even though he didn't hear anything she'd said out there. Tears sprang to Jenna's eyes and she leaned into him and let him hold her. His body radiated warmth, and she felt so loved. The love of this man brought tears of joy to her face and a breathlessness to her very soul. A few minutes later, the attorney told Blaine it was his turn to testify. He looked so strong and put together, unfrazzled by the unpleasant moment as he followed the attorney into the main area. An hour later, when they were standing at Jenna's car, Danny squealed. It's over! Jenna hugged her fiercely, so thankful beyond words for the way the judge had ruled. Mike would be serving a few years in a state prison for second-degree murder against Blaine, as well as a life sentence for attempted first-degree murder against Jenna, and Bud, his accomplice, would be in prison for several years. The awful nervousness that had wrecked her body now drifted away. She'd carried a fear within her for so long that not feeling it any longer seemed so strange. Hey, you okay? Danny tilted her head at Jenna as they broke apart. Yeah, better than okay, she said, finding a normal breath again. I am so thankful for you. She looked at Blaine now, too. For both of you. I couldn't have done this without you. She blinked back tears, but they poured out anyway. Blaine and Danny closed in, and the three of them held each other for a long moment. When they pulled away, they were all smiling, their faces happy as could be. By the time Jenna got home, she was exhausted and in a state of gratifying reprieve. The nightmare was over, and in its place was a possible dream come true. Blaine liked her a lot, it was clear. Both by his words and actions, he cared deeply for her. Maybe he even loved her. A shiver ignited her nerves. She didn't know how or when it happened, 
but she knew she was feeling something she'd never felt before. A certain affection was growing in her heart, and the sense of peace that came with it made her heart sing. Jenna loved Blaine. As she plopped onto the sofa, she couldn't contain the smile that stretched across her face. Chapter 13 Nor did she want to. Easter arrived, and with it came the typical cool, crisp weather of spring. Blaine packed a picnic basket full of mini sandwiches and sodas for everybody. Getting the staff sergeant position had meant everything to Blaine. He'd worked hard for many years to earn the status. But having Jenna in his life mattered just as much to him. More than the savior she'd called him, he wanted to be with her. He loved her. He wanted her to love him, too. But she didn't trust men. Getting close to a man, allowing herself to open up again, probably felt like jumping into a pool of broken glass. He wanted her to know what it was like to feel loved, truly, what it was like to feel uncontrolled by someone, to be free. After the court date, her whole demeanor had changed. Her face glistened brightly and her step was light. It was as if the sun itself shined all around her. To be a part of a positive change in someone was astounding. He was thankful to be in her life, to have the opportunity to witness her transformation. They'd gone bowling again. At her request, he picked her up instead of them meeting there. To no surprise, she had beat him again, but she'd taught him how to hold the ball properly, how to stand just so, how much breathing and concentration affected the outcome. He ended up getting a few spares, his score much less embarrassing than previously. At her request, they went on a date to the movies afterward. They held hands the entire time, and every time he looked at her, he no longer saw the fear or uncertainty that had once existed. Now all he saw was contentment, and he would be celebrating the holiday with a woman he loved. Jenna was waiting outside in her front yard when he pulled up. He hopped out and held open the passenger door of the Honda. She wore a light yellow dress with sleeves that billowed out around her shoulders. Her lips glowed with a soft pink gloss. Her dark honey hair was pulled back into a low ponytail. Everything about her looked refreshed. She was stunning. Good morning, she said. Her fingernails grazed his wrist as she greeted him. Her touch didn't fail to ignite a spark. She paused at the car door. I had a really good time with you. Every time I'm with you feels so right. I haven't known anything like this, but I like it. I like being with you, Blaine. She hesitated as though working up the courage to go on. I thank God I get to be here with you. Her eyes lingered on his, and she moved closer until their mouths were inches apart. Her hot breath tickled his cheek as her lips brushed his. He wrapped his arms around her waist and responded to her kiss. She pulled him tighter to her until there was no space between them. Heat radiated from her, entangling them as though they were one heartbeat. He could feel her heart beating anxiously next to his chest, and his own responding with the same enthusiasm. Well, I guess we better get going, she said breathlessly when they finally parted, staring at each other and raptured. He nodded, unable to catch his own breath as he closed the door after her. They met his parents on the beach. No one else was there. The day had warmed up slightly, but an ongoing light breeze kept the temperature mostly cool. We're here, Blaine announced as he toted their beach chairs and picnic basket to the extra-large towel and equally large red umbrella his parents had set up. Jenna, this is my mom, Norma, and my dad, Hank. Mom, Dad, this is my girlfriend, Jenna. His parents jumped to their feet and greeted her with warm hugs. With Jenna's permission, Blaine had informed them about the passing of her mom. It's so nice to meet you, Jenna, his mom said. We're thankful we get to celebrate Easter with you. And it's such beautiful weather. A perfect day, she beamed. Thank you. I'm glad to be here with you all, Jenna said. She threaded her hand through Blaine's. His heart knocked madly at the thought that she was initiating things between them. She was able to hold his hand, start a kiss, reach out to him first. It was a miracle. His dad spread out a buffet of food. 
Blaine's mini sandwiches, a bowl of potato salad, celery and carrot sticks with dip, a tray of fruit, and deviled eggs topped with black olives. Jenna's eyes grew big. I've never seen so much food at once, his parents chuckled. Not your typical Easter meal, I suppose, his dad quipped. Before we start, I'd like to say something, Blaine said. He faced Jenna. I wrote something for you. It isn't much, it's only two lines, but it helps me explain how I feel about you. He cleared his throat and pulled out the sheet of paper he'd tucked into the small pocket of the beach bag. Holding the paper in his hands, he glanced away from it and looked at Jenna. A heart so fine, it beats with mine. Her hair flows with grace around her face. He reached over to take Jenna's hand. She threaded her soft fingers through his. You are precious, and I am so blessed to have you in my life, he said. Her eyes watered as she squeezed his hand in hers. Thank you, she whispered, her smile dressing up her entire face so lovely and serene. His mom said a short prayer over their food, then the four of them began to eat. The ocean pounded into the sand as the sun sparkled over its surface. A lone seagull tiptoed down the shore. The breeze lifted, fanning a few loose hairs from her ponytail around Jenna's face, revealing her beauty even more as she relished in the meal. His parents went for a walk, leaving them alone. Blaine and Jenna embraced, the beach all theirs for a short time. She smelled of roses and honey and everything sweet. He breathed her in and she held him tighter. And all was right in their world. Back at his parents' house, the Easter egg hunt went into full session immediately. Just like when he was a child, his parents had planted several colorful boiled eggs throughout the yard, including some plastic candy-filled eggs. His mom handed Blaine and Jenna each a wicker basket filled with plastic grass. Now, since there are two of you this year, one of you will stand on this side of the lawn and the other will start on the opposite end. Jenna giggled. Is this a competition? Why, yes it is his mom said, amused. Jenna already knows I'm a good sport, mom. His dad arched an eyebrow. My son? Jenna smirked as she looked at Blaine. Well, he is with me. Okay, ready? His mom said, holding up a stopwatch. On your marks? Get set! Go! Jenna rushed to the window, spotting a bright yellow egg, and snatched it, hurrying to the next sill where she swiped another egg for her basket. Blaine watched her with love overpouring his heart, taking his time to gather the eggs he found and admiring her childlike eagerness as she skipped from one spot to the next. After they'd found all the eggs and enjoyed the hidden candies with his parents at the dining table, Jenna said, Thank you, Hank and Norma, for making me a part of this day. It reminds me of the times with my mom. You both have made me feel like part of your family. She stood and hugged Blaine's parents. You are so welcome, Jenna. It is our pleasure, his mom beamed as Jenna stepped back. Feeling full from all the food, Blaine suggested a walk. He and Jenna ventured back outside to the front garden, literally smelling the roses. I've always liked red roses the most, Jenna said as she breathed in one of the full blooms. It smells like perfume. She turned to face him and slightly opened her arms out toward him. Without hesitation, he pulled her into his arms. Together, they turned to face the ocean. The beauty of the sun-splashed Pacific gleamed in the distance. Malibu Bay had never looked so much like home. This day had been made just for them, a new life for them both, and love for each of them for the very first time. He stared down into her face. I am beyond thankful for you, Jenna. My life feels complete with you in it. He stared into her soft brown eyes, filled with affection as they rested on his. He dropped his gaze to her mouth and brushed his lips over it. She leaned into the kiss. It was long and soft and warm, and when he pulled away, he could see the love in her eyes. It was time. I love you, he told her, their faces still so close together he could feel her breath on his skin. You are all I ever wanted, she said, her eyes brimming with tears of joy. 
and more than i could have ever dreamed of this has been sworn you. to sacrifice a christian military romantic suspense book number four clean billionaire standalone holiday romance series written by christina ryan narrated by grace noble copyright 2020 to 2022 by krista wagner produced and published by krista wagner thank you for listening